education. Uh, let's see, uh, Superintendent, will you uh, take the roll? Yes, Mr. Reed. Here. Mr. Hoover. No, for the record, he's absent. Mr. Clark. Here. Mr. Short. Here. Mr. Huey. Here. Mr. Rasta. Here. Ms. Perez. And Ms. Perez is also absent. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. All right, we will be uh, adjourning to closed session to address uh, items uh, subject to closed session, including student matters, employer-employee relations, conference with legal counsel related to litigation, conference with real property negotiators or, and or personnel matters. Uh, is there any public comment related to closed session items? No, Mr. Reed. Okay, hearing none. Uh, we will adjourn to closed session and we will be back uh, at 6 p.m. Thank you.
right, uh, welcome back from a closed session and welcome to the September 8th meeting of the Folsom Cordova, Cordova Unified School District Board of Education meeting. Um, we're gonna start uh, today's uh, meeting just with a moment of silence uh, in honor of uh, Jennifer Mulder, uh, who was a third grade teacher um, at Mangini Ranch who passed away uh, uh, last week, so. All right, thank you. All right, uh, we will start uh, with the Pledge of Allegiance. If you would please stand and join me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, uh, broadcast statement. Uh, broadcast and recording is being made at the direction of the board and the broadcast may capture images and sounds of those attending the meeting. The meeting is being live streamed on the district's YouTube channel. Folsom Cordova Unified School District Board Policy 1313 promotes mutual respect, civility, and orderly conduct among employees, parents, and the public. We will treat staff, parents, and members of the public with respect and expect the same in return. If any member of the public uses obscenities or communicates in a demanding, loud, insulting, and or demeaning manner, the board will calmly and politely admonish the person to communicate civilly. Public comments during board meetings are an important component of public engagement and transparency, uh, and all written comments made to the board by 3 p.m. have been read, but I will make this uh, notice that uh, we did not receive any written comments for today's board meeting. Uh, per the Brown Act, the board is not allowed to enter into a two-way discussion on any matter uh, not on the agenda. Uh, Superintendent, will you take uh, the roll, please? Yes, Mr. Reed. Here. Mr. Hoover. Here. Mr. Clark. Here. Mr. Short. Here. Mr. Huey. Here. Ms. Perez. Here. Ms. Rasta. Here. All are counted for. Thank you. All right, uh, item number five, reporting out of closed session, Superintendent. We have no action to report out of closed session tonight, Mr. Reed. Thank you. All right, uh, adoption of the agenda. Is there a motion? I'll move it. Motion by Mr. Clark. Second. Second by Mr. Hoover. Superintendent, take the roll. Mr. Reed. Aye. Mr. Hoover. Aye. Mr. Clark. Aye. Mr. Short. Aye. Mr. Huey. Aye. Ms. Perez. Here. Ms. Trostov. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, that takes us to spe special presentations. Uh, the first one for students, which is the FCLA highlights connections from Mills uh, Middle School. Yes, I'm going to ask Ms. Strawn, who is our president of FCLA, to come up and introduce our team from Mills Middle School. Um, at the first meeting of each month, FCLA's highlight will be on, on school presentations. This year, our theme is on connections and building relationships. And we want to welcome the Mills Middle School team, Ms. Kerrigan and her, her team of folks that are joining her and her student, too. Um, and Ms. Strawn will do the introductions. I think you just did them beautifully. Good evening, <laughs> President Reed, Dr. Kleegan, and members of the board. Um, it's my honor to uh, introduce Mills Middle School, who's going to be sharing a wonderful way that they, in fact, build connections and make uh, school quite fun because we really do believe that school is fun. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Dr. Kleegan, President Reed, board members. I'm Dana Kerrigan. I'm the principal at Mills. And I'd like to introduce the team we brought here tonight. Uh, first, we have our mental health specialist, Aya Handler, our student leadership advisor, Allison Renth, and our student body president, Sandra Harrow. Okay. And with that, um, we're gonna talk a little bit about what we implemented this year, um, something fun at lunch to help our students feel more connected to school and to each other and to our staff as well. So I'm gonna turn this over to the brainchild of this idea, <laughs> Miss Aya. Hello, my name is Aya. I'm the mental health specialist at Mills um, and co-creator of FAM. Uh, next slide. Um, so what is FAM? FAM stands for Fun at Mills. And if you can see our shirts, we have it on the back right here and on the front. Um, so our goal with FAM is to create a fun, 
engaging social environment and culture at Mills. Um, we wanted to put together lunchtime activities for the students to engage in. If you can see on the pictures, um, these are some examples of the activities that we have been doing. Uh, the team is myself, um, Mr. Mejia, who's a school counselor, Ms. Renth, mm -hmm. our leadership teacher, and Ms. Romero, our other school counselor. So we connected um, and part are partnering with our um, student leadership class. Next slide. Okay, so why do we create FAM? So when um, we came back to school after the pandemic, uh, we noticed that the students were not socializing in the way that they normally did. Um, oftentimes they were on their phones and they seemed hesitant to connect with each other. So we wanted to create um, an environment where they could, could start connecting again. Um, and that's why we started with these lunchtime activities um, to get them engaging, connected, and having fun. I mean, school, it's like if you have a reason to come to school and something's fun, some activity, like you want to be there and, and we want you there. So that's why that's why we created FAM. And also a little backstory. So FAM is also slang for family. So it's it's almost a term of endearment. When you call somebody FAM, like that's your family. And so that's part of the other, you know, the other reason why we named it FAM. Like we want it to be a family at Mills. We want everyone to be connected, students and staff. Uh, next slide. So, so far students are really enjoying this and a majority of them do participate at lunch. So they go to their lunch and then they come out and if you've been at Mills in the quad, there's like the awning, the covering. And so that's where we usually do it. And they're just really engaged and looking for it. I also teach sixth grade and they're asking me like, what is it gonna be today? And I kind of like to keep it a surprise and suspenseful to them. Um, when they do it, they're in a safe, fun and positive way. So there is a counselor out there with them and then student leadership's is there helping the kids, cleaning up, making sure that everyone has what they need to do the activity. Um, some activities that we have done so far are face painting, obstacle courses, coloring contests, music and dancing, and we have planned some for the year. And some of them are board games, free throw contests, musical chairs, limbo, potato sack races, beach ball relays, double dutch, and so much more. So um, one thing I wanted to add is that on the days that we do this at lunchtime, there is a notable, noticeable difference of feeling in the air. It's just this electric buzz that is so positive that you don't feel as much of on the other days. Um, and as far as you know, students may be making some not so good choices <laughs> during lunchtime, they're very, very uh, much reduced on days that we do FAM because they're engaged in something positive and fun to do. Um, so if, if we could, we'd do it every day, <laughs> but it's a lot of work, but um, it's really fun. So next slide, please. So in the spirit of connection, I do wanna end with a quote by Brene Brown. Connection is the energy that exists between people when they feel seen, heard, and valued when they can give and receive without judgment, and when they derive sustenance and strength from the relationship. So again, we want our kids to feel like they are being seen, heard, and valued, and not being judged, and feel connected to school, staff, and their peers. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Does the board have any uh, questions for? Oh. <laughs> I have to meet with, meet with her after. I have to meet with her after. So, <laughs> do you guys have any questions for us, you all? Dana, uh, great presentation. Um, so, quick question, uh, and I'm not quite sure what the scheduling is. What time is your lunch tomorrow? Because I think I'm going to come out and hang oh, out. Oh, that would be wonderful. So we have two lunches. Okay. Um, and they're they're quite crowded. We keep our students in the quad and in the multi. Hopefully, they're most of them are in the multi right now because of the heat and the right. smoke. Um, but we are still doing it. Uh, we have our A lunch starts at 11.45 and they're half hour. And then our B lunch starts at 12.40. Perfect. All right, yeah. we'll see you there. That'd be great. Love to have you. All right. Anybody have any other questions or, or comments for the other members? Any other questions? Just one quick question. Forgive me if I missed it. You, you said it's not daily. How frequently are you guys out there? Right now we're doing it every other Friday. Great. And probably going to increase it. We were also um, 
uh, going to incorporate in as time goes on here. We just recently received um, some giant board games, thanks to Mr. Maroon, Maroon over there and his creative uh, problem solving, because we were complaining quite a bit in the spring about lunchtime and needing things for kids to do. So he uh, helped us secure, gosh, 10 different sets of giant board games like Giant Jenga, Jump Rope, Cornhole, things like that. And so we have actually experimented on our staff. Um, and they loved it at our back to school staff meeting, but they loved it. Um, and so we're gonna incorporate that into FAM as well. So hopefully it will become every single Friday once we start doing that. And I think once the heat you know, goes down a little bit too. Music every Friday. And music's every Friday. There's always music and dancing every Friday. Okay. They love the Macarena nah. <laughs> still. <laughs> Aya loves to lead it. <laughs> so. Well, I, yeah, I just want to thank you for being out there. I know having those positive interactions with adults that might be a little different than what typically happens, uh, especially when you're out at lunch, has a huge difference, like you said, on the culture. And uh, thanks for your work on this. Thank you. And they do see us a little bit in a different light when we're sitting down and getting our face painted with them and yeah. that kind of thing. So <laughs> thank you for having us. Really appreciate it. Thank and you. thank you, Ms. Strong. I, I actually well. have, have a question. Um, so you indicated that uh, these big board games, actually, I think we got them for all the middle schools. Right. right? Yes. Um, are they being rolled out at all the middle schools the same way, only on a Friday? Or, 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 or I th my impression was some of the middle schools were providing these resources every lunch period and not just on a Friday. I'm, I'm not sure how the other ones are, are doing it. Yeah. Um, I, I, have you noticed a decrease in, in cell phone usage when, uh, when you have these types of events? I'd say yes and no, mostly probably for what they're being used for. So instead of being on their phones texting or playing games, you know, playing uh, games is very popular uh, with our students. They like to take lots of pictures of the activities and what's happening, so. Taking pictures, is that a violation of our board policy? I'm not sure if we are, you're allowed to take pictures on school campus. Of our students? Yeah. If we have their clearance, yes. They have yeah. Photo release. Yeah. yeah I would if think so. If the photo release, yeah, the parent signs release. the photo release. Right, but if the students are taking pictures on campus, anyway, something to oh. look into. I, I'm not sure if. Uh, anyway, um, the activities. I, I was also uh, wondering, you know, how how is the cell phone issues going? I mean, our next presentation is specifically on cell phones and the use of technology and the overuse of technology, if you will, uh, and the the harm that it. it, it uh, the harms that it creates for students. Mm -hmm. um, how, how are you seeing the implementation of the cell phone policy at, at, at Mills? Um, it's, you know, right now it's, it's um, at lunch and before and after last right. spell. Do you see very much in violation of that or is that pretty Well, consistent? we constantly teach and remind students about responsible cell phone use. We, we have lessons that we've created that we do during advisory on technology use, not just cell phones, but with the internet and things like that. Um, and so I think with the frequent reminders, a large majority of our kids do practice responsible cell phone use and use them only during the designated times. All right, good. And only in the designated, designated locations. Yeah. So. Yeah. No, I, I think uh, what you're doing is phenomenal. Um, I, I, I think uh, creating this this energy, this positivity um, at at Mills, and uh, and I really like what Mr. Maroon was able to to get for all the middle schools. Yes. Um, and you know, I would you know, obviously it's a, it's a new program, and, and new programs can always be expanded. So uh, definitely would encourage you to um, you know find ways to get more. Um, interactivity with the students, especially at lunchtime, to give them other opportunities other than the cell phone. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks. You're welcome. Appreciate it. Okay. All right. That takes us. Uh, yeah. Uh, that takes us to our next presentation on uh, from staff on internet, cyber, and cell phone safety presentation. 
Uh, this one I, I'm actually uh, very much looking forward to. I, I, I had actually requested this after I saw the speaker uh, speak last spring at uh, Sutter Middle School. She did a phenomenal presentation, and uh, I think I, I think I was still in in the the presentation when I, I believe I was texting the superintendent saying we need this exact same presentation at our board meeting. Uh, I mean, this is this is really important stuff, folks. You know, I. I you know, the technology is one of those things that, I mean, it's been out there, but it kind of snuck up on us because we just weren't paying attention. We, this is our first generation. Well, actually, I guess we're probably going into our second generation of, of kids with, with this type of technology. Um, but, you know, I mean, I think at, at initial, we didn't, we didn't know how it was going to impact uh, until we actually experienced it. So, um, so, Superintendent, if you want to introduce us. Yes, well, with that introduction, I, I think uh, I'll just introduce Ms. Kelly Richardson, marriage and family therapist, who has just worked very closely with our district and our students and our staff over the years. And she was invited to give the presentation at our um, Internet Cyber and Cell Phone Safety Evening last spring. And as Mr. Reed said, made an impression on all those that attended and said we wanted this message to be shared more broadly and we'd bring it here, um, kind of a condensed version of what we presented at Sutter Middle School. But to hear some of the high points of what we all need to be aware of in reminding our students whether we're at home or at school. So welcome, Kelly. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm gonna actually use my electronics to set it to <laughs> 10 minutes because I am known for speaking much longer than that. So when this goes off, it'll let me know to be done. Uh, thank you so much, and um, I appreciate and honor to be welcome to be here speaking with you guys. By way of introduction, I'm a licensed psychotherapist with a private practice in Folsom that specializes in working with teenagers and families. I've been licensed for 25 years. Um, and I'm the mom of three, all that have gone through our school district, um, all that are done, all that are two in college and one um, up in playing football. Um, I also write a blog called Theramom, which is about being a mom and a therapist. So before I start, I wanna say that we always talk about teenagers and their addiction to electronics, but let's face it, adults struggle with the exact same thing. So we can't just point our fingers at our young people. If I were to ask you to take out your phone and completely turn it off, some of you might say, well, my spouse might need to get a hold of me or my child might get a hold of me. So it's really hard to do that. Maybe um, I'm watching a game on my phone or maybe I'm ordering something on Amazon. And so it's the exact same thing that our, our young people experience. There's always something they need to do. And we are a society that likes to stay connected, informed, and instantly gratified. And that's exactly what our electronics do. Think about your own personal electronic usage. Most of the time when the phone dings, the notices are about something trivial, but we have the urge to see what it says. That's a human nature. And we, from certain ones, we get that momentary hit of joy. And those are the messages that get us and keep us hooked. The same dynamic happens with our young people. When we think of addiction, we think of things like alcohol and gambling, pornography, shopping, food. Uh, however, addiction is much more intertwined in our lifestyle than people think it is. For example, the majority of the world's population is addicted to caffeine. Even though caffeine is known to be addictive, many people, will not start their day without a cup of coffee. So ever try and take away a teenager's phone and they freak out? <laughs> well, what if I told you no more coffee? That you had to now start your day without that hit of caffeine. That's how they feel when we take away their electronics. How many of you have ever heard of the term nomophobia? N-O-M-O -O, phobia. Most people probably haven't. And while it's not in our DSM-5, it's actually starting to become a used term within our profession. Nomophobia stands for no mobile phone phobia. And they're actually saying that it could become a true diagnosis in the DSM-6. And while it's not really technically a phobia, they are finding it and classifying it under anxiety disorders because they are seeing the amount of anxiety that is caused when the kids experience nomophobia. 
A study sound, found in 2016 found that 50% of teenagers ages 13 to 18 feel addicted to their mobile phone. And 72% of teenagers feel the need to immediately respond to text messages, social networking messages, and other notifications. A couple of like things that, to look at, what does nomophobia feel like in the body? The chest feels tight, trouble breathing, sweating, rapid heart rate. One of the things we hear all the time is kids say, I'm having a panic attack, I'm freaking out. So often, very similar symptoms. When people have an addiction to their phone, they know the fear is extreme, but they have a hard time managing the feelings and the addiction to their phone and the electronics is somewhat similar to addiction to the other things that I spoke of earlier that have that same exact draw and that same exact effect on the body. So what is internet addiction? It's an umbrella term that refers to the compulsive need to spend a great deal of time on the internet and when we say internet, let me qualify. That includes Instagram, TikTok, Facebook. Uh, now there's Be Real. There's all kinds of, I mean, and they're always coming up with something new. So the, the term internet addiction, it is an umbrella term for all of those potential sites that our young people watch. TikTok obviously being one of the most popular right now. Um, when the person becomes dependent on that internet and they need to spend more and more time to achieve that same high. Many symptoms of internet addiction are congruent with the signs of substance abuse. This is due to the fact that under brain scans, we know internet addiction and substance abuse addiction share the same neurological footprint. According to the American Psychiatric Association, internet addiction can include the following. The user needs to spend an ever-increasing amount of time online. If they can't go online, they experience unpleasant withdrawal symptoms such as anxiety, moodiness, and compulsive fantasizing about the internet. The user turns to the internet to cope with negative feelings such as guilt, anxiety, loneliness, or depression. You put a bunch of people in a room where they don't know anybody, everybody's gonna get on their phone because it's uncomfortable. The user spends significant amount of time engaging in activities such as even researching, or you know, YouTube is huge with kids, right? They'll go on YouTube for hours and look and research and look, and it just hooks them in. The user is prepared to lose relationships in favor of having their addiction met through the internet. So some other little things, there is an absorption and an obsession that I think so many of our teens are having and, and people in general with their electronics. Uh, there is an excessive and problematic hours spent on their electronics. Often checking sites in the morning, it's the first thing they do. Most of us, when we used to get up, right, you would get up, use the restroom, maybe go get the paper, have a cup of coffee most people's first response is to check their phone. Anxiety, depression, irritability are all connected to access to their smartphone, tablet, and when their laptop is taken away. We see academic problems, dropping of grades, missing assignments, disengaged, sleeping in class, disinterested in other pastimes. I always say, when we gave, my daughter was a voracious reader until we gave her her cell phone, and I, Truly, truly regret that. And while we still, my kids still had to take their phone and it had to be put on a bookshelf at night, it changed her reading and that just saddens me because before that she was a voracious reader. They also cover up and lie about the amount of time on their internet. Um, they use it for, uh, as a crutch, as an escape from negative emotions. They avoid responsibilities such as schoolwork, chores, after school job in lieu of spending time on the internet. There is a significant dis, uh, change in personal hygiene. We see kids that are, would rather be on their phone than take a shower. And we also see changes in eating and sleeping patterns. Internet with teenagers shows up with video game addiction, which isn't just gaming. It can be on their phones, Snapchat, Instagram, in YouTube. A survey suggests that males who are addicted are most likely addicted to either video gaming or viewing pornography websites. 
while females are more about relationship issues, body image issues, and cybersexual relations with a potential predator. Many teenagers use the internet as a form of coping. It's uh, for them, it, if they're feeling vulnerable, it's a way to feel like they can check out socially without appearing strange or different. They use it as relief from social anxiety, as a relief from feeling pressured or overwhelmed, and as a way to check out when life feels too stressful. This generation, Gen Z, has lost the ability to handle boredom. I'm gonna say that again, because I truly, truly believe this. This generation, Gen Z, has lost the ability to handle boredom. When we were growing up, I don't know about you, we would sit down to play a game of Monopoly and it would take four hours and you had to wait your turn and everybody went around. Try and play a board game with kids. They're checking their phone in between the whole time. Mm -hmm. That ability to be bored is no longer there. They have grown up, they say that our us old people, we are technology immigrants. They are technology natives. Mm -hmm. A study published in 20, January 2022 said that on average, teenagers are spending eight hours in front of their screen a day. And this is not taking into account online learning. The same study found that as screen time increased, so did adolescents worry and stress and coping skills decreased. They found a direct correlation in excessive screen time and eating disorders. Where am I time? Oh, gosh, I have 13 seconds. Okay, um, I will try and skip through a whole bunch of stuff. Yeah, no, I no, actually, ahead. no, please, yeah, this is please. important. Uh, yeah, keep, keep turn speaking. Off. Are you sure? Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay, yes. my phone's going to go off right now. Um, I apologize. Um, Teenagers have been increasingly accustomed to lengthy periods of time connecting to the internet and disconnecting themselves from the surrounding world and proving that easier access has increased risk to things such as cyberbullying and online predators, which we are seeing a, a rise and sadly a continued rise in that. Teenagers who engage in problematic internet use are most likely to use their phone for cyber sex through sexting or access apps, which, which could potentially increase the risk of sexual addiction and exposure to online sexual forums. One negative effect of the internet addiction is that people, and especially we're seeing this young people, are struggling with offline relationships. Like they're, they're struggling with that ability to just regularly communicate. Teenagers now, they have they have their friends and they actually, they call them the IRL, my in real life friends versus my online friends. So now we have this distinction, my IRL friends and my real friends. A recent study based on teenagers said that teens felt like they had three times the online friendships than the real life ones. Another study also showed that social anxiety is connected very closely to internet addiction and more prominent with males. One important point to be mindful is that so many people, and we're seeing it younger and younger, use social media, use our electronics as babysitters. They use it for their kids early on as babysitters, and we can see that addiction beginning. It used to be kids didn't even get cell phones till they were in high school, right? Then it's middle. And now we're seeing first and second graders carry their cell phones to school. And I get it in the age of active shooters. I get that parents are scared and frightened of that. But the response to it of giving your child something else like this, I don't know if that's a safer response. One component that needs to be addressed is how the pandemic had a direct effect on teenagers and their internet addiction. During a developmental period in their life, often characterized by the importance of peer-related relationships, the internet became a lifeline to our teenagers. It rerouted their personal interactions into the virtual world. It provided a sense of community, it, uh, school, sports, church, everything became on their electronics. It wasn't just a source of entertainment anymore. Because teenagers were isolated, their only sense of connection came to the, through the usage of internet and the addiction grew stronger for so many teenagers. Researchers saw an increase in behavioral problems, lack of motivation, suicidal behaviors, depression, anxiety, inability to focus, 
or maintain and uh, the ability to not handle stressful situations. And I will tell you from a personal note, starting in 2020, and I, like I said, I've been in practice 25 years, I have never been busier, ever. And, I'm prob- and I probably turned down, I, my practice is full, full, and I probably turned down 10 to 15 people a week that are trying to find therapy for their kids. And I feel awful, there's only so much I can do, but we're seeing so many kids the anxiety and the depression, and I think it all ties back with the phones and with the pandemic and what it did, and I think that it's all interconnected. When school was online, it made it easier for them to access excessive use of the internet, and they were connected to their, their electronics all day long. So this begs the question, what are we to do? If you're worried about your teenager's addiction or our teenager's addiction to the internet, we are not alone. Before I start this final section, let me add, if we want our teenagers to become aware and change their internet and electronic habits, we as adults, as their parents, as their mentors, as their teachers, we have to do the same. If we want them to, we can't ask them to put their phone down during dinner if we don't, or during a class, or during a show, or something. We have to be willing to do what we are asking. We have to model what we want them to do. And if we aren't willing to put down our electronics, then why would they? If we are complaining about them playing Fortnite, perhaps we need to put down Facebook. When our kids were in high school, we implemented a very unpopular rule in our house. At 10 a.m., and my daughter's like, please don't tell this because nobody should have to do this. On school, uh, on school nights, all phones had to be put in the living room, charged outside of their bedrooms on chargers that were in the living room. And I'm, I, 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 we don't think of us as really strict parents, but at that 10 o'clock, those phones were put away. They were plugged into the bookshelf, and if they were 10 minutes late or more, that 10 minutes got deducted the night from the next night. Uh, they had to turn them in at 9.50 the next night. They were not thankful, and they did not appreciate us for doing this. But as parents, and as educators, and as people that are molding young kids right now, we have to be willing to do what is right, not what is popular. None of our kids had TVs in their bedroom when they were growing up. Still don't. For us, if we wanted them to be out with us, they were forced to come out and to join. We called it FFF, Forced Family Fun. (laughs) <laughs> During the pandemic, I hung a giant crossword puzzle and taped 20 bucks to it, whoever got the most. We have to be able to think creatively because for them, the easy response is to go to their phone. So I'm sorry, if I'm, I'll wrap it up. Um, one of the things we have to help our parents with is having uncomfortable conversations. So many parents don't know how to have uncomfortable conversations with their young people. Talking to their kids about teenage addiction, internet addiction, can make a difference in their health, their relationships, their academic performances, all of that. And if parents aren't willing to have that uncomfortable conversation, then their young people are getting the advice from their peers and probably people who we don't want them to get that advice from. So we have to explain chat windows to parents. We have to talk about them. A chat window is when your kid is stuck in your car and they're right next to you and you have them captive and you have that chat window and you don't do it when they're hangry. That's a bad time. You do it when they're open and we have this. They have to get curious. We have to encourage parents how to ask questions to their teenagers. Um, We have to discuss boundaries. We have to explain that. We have to take a technology break. My kids, I would call it an e-break. They thought that was really lame, but that's what I called it. Like, everybody's taking an e-break for an hour. We have to implement screen-free dinner. Phones have no place at the dinner table. We have to define phone-free zones, like the table, an hour before bed, car rides sometimes, like little increments of car rides. We um, have to help them come up with ideas for when they're bored. Being bored is not a bad thing. It actually stimulates the creative process in our brain. And we have to teach our young people how to be bored. That's so important. They have to learn to think creatively and they have their mind know that it does not need to be filled every idle minute with something. So to wrap up, 
if you think parenting is hard and confusing and overwhelming and frustrating and scary and exhausting, then you're probably doing something right. We need to teach parents that it's okay to set boundaries, to have tough conversations, to make family time a priority, and to always trust their gut. And if they think that their young person is on their phone too much or they're concerned, they have to know what to do to make those changes. Um, I think that we have to explain to parents that they also have to learn to trust their gut and they have to be willing to put their phone down if that's what they're expecting from their young person. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, board member questions. Uh, we'll start with um, board member Srivastava. Yeah, sure. Um, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, one of the questions I had was, I noticed we talked a lot about the negatives of um, self cell phone usage, but I'd love to hear from your perspective. What are some of those positives that youth gain from being able to access the internet? Right. So that's a great question, right? It's not all negative. It allows us to see places of the world we've never seen. It allows us to connect to people quickly. There's a certain sense of safety that some people feel with having their phone. We can, as parents, we can track our kids on Life360 and make sure that they're safely driving and things like that. I think for young people, um, I think there is a sense of that ability to have some connection. For some people that struggle socially, they can feel like they're connected and that's not in a person-to-person um, way and for some people that struggle with true social anxiety, it's helpful. So I think there are a lot of positives that come with it, but I think what we're seeing is younger and younger, the internet addiction is pu like putting its tentacles into other areas that are unhealthy. Um, and that's what we have to be careful of. Everything in life, I'm not a real big fan of the word balance because I think balance means something's up and something's down. I think that the word is harmony and we have to teach them how to harmonize the good usage with their cell electronics and also learning how to have conversations and learning how to, how to be bored and learning how to be creative. And we have to teach them how to harmonize those two. Good uh, question though from, that's a good question. Uh, board member Perez, do you have any questions? So my only question was how can parenting affect a student's emotional level that desires them to reach for their phone? Say that again. So how does how does a parent's parenting level affect a student's emotional level that prompts their desire to reach for their phone? So if they think like their parents are, are stressing out, they're going to go to their phone? Yeah, correct. Are their main reason for the de depression and anxiety? Yeah, I think that it's just become a coping skill because there's a checkout from it. We all know. I mean, I, I'm guilty of it. I think so many of us are guilty. If we're in a situation, sometimes even, you know, if just pulling up a Pinterest and it's like, oh kind of makes you feel a little relaxed or watching a couple TikToks, right? I mean, <laughs> I'm guilty of that too. And the thing I can tell you is, is the, so the response, instead of being able to have conversations is just to go to the phone. And I think that the parent response when a parent gets angry at their kids so often, the kid retreats to their phone or their electronics or their video games because it brings a sense of calm that maybe they're not knowing how to access without that electronic. Uh, let's see. Let me go. No. Uh, Mr. Short? I have not. Okay. Um, Mr. Clark? Yeah, I do. Um, Kelly, thank you so much for that presentation. And you talked a little bit about online predators. Um, is it only the sexual online predators? Or are we looking at predators that are targeting kids that, you know, if they're online and they say, oh, I'm having this anxiety? I, well, put it this way the whole fentanyl thing and how kids get addicted to that. I know some of it is basically online, chatting with their online friends. Uh, do you see that a growing issue moving forward? Uh, kids getting those online predators being, I mean, targeted? Well, I think, kids? you know, it's interesting you bring up the, the fentanyl. Fentanyl is not an addiction. It's a right. one pill kill, right? Well, that's true too. And so but... it's one of those things that, yeah, I mean, if you if you look up the young man from Rockland, Right, and exactly. he met the, the person that gave him his fentanyl pill. He, on Snapchat, reached out through Snapchat, met him, met him at the Galleria, and went home, took his pill. So we have that access. The thing that, we, I, and I, I say this when I, I, I speak to, I do some middle school presentations, and I often ask kids, like, do you know what the words WWW stand for? And they don't anymore. Yeah. 
and they don't realize that it stands for the World Wide Web, which means we are now open ourselves to all kinds of people around the world. So whether it be, you know, people that are, are pimping drugs, um, whether it be predators, I mean, it's they're open, they're susceptible to all of that. And that's the thing. I once heard a, a great comment through um, my friend Jason Browning, who worked for Folsom Police, and he asked people, how many of you uh, have... Uh, alarms in your house and most of us raised our hand and he's like why set the alarm if you're letting your kid have their phone in their bedroom hmm. why why are if you're letting your kid have the phone in their bedroom why are you even setting an alarm because the same predator can come right after your child through the phone so without that boundary um, I think they're susceptible to all kinds of things okay and um, I'm not tech savvy. I mean, my daughter set up my Facebook years ago, so that just tell you um, how prehistoric I am. But my cousin, who obviously played for Coach Chris, who's uh, a player at ASU, he's really active on Twitter now. And I don't know if this is true. Maybe you can clarify it. I don't know if Coach had that same philosophy of, because he said, well, I'm active now because Coach never let me get on social media. <laughs> is that true? That my husband? Yes. My husband was very strict on social media. That's what I thought. <laughs> because we know the forming brain right. says and does things that it, you know, I mean, I'm relieved there was no Twitter when I was in college because I don't want a trace of what I was thinking or saying or in high school. Right. I'm glad that there's nothing. And they don't realize that. And one of the things that, yes, my husband was a huge advocate of that because he saw people say dumb things. Right. And, and it, 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 to them, it just seemed flippant and quick. And the thing that we, our young people don't understand is one retweet and you've lost complete control of whatever you've put out there. That's right. all it takes. It takes one retweet. At that moment, you can take it back. You can say, I didn't mean it. It's out there. So, you know, I, I, and, and to your point over here about what are some goods. Okay, so I think that, you know, some things like Twitter do, do are funny and there are memes and there are things that make people laugh. But the harmony, the balance of that, the other side of that is that we have to be careful of what gets said because right. once it's out there, it's like toothpaste. You can't put it back in the tube. Yeah, well, I think what Coach was doing was trying to protect his players. And I mean, you know, obviously those players that were playing at that level of uh, high school football and he knew that they had potential. I don't know if he meant it for the whole team, but I do know some players that are actually doing quite well uh, that play for Folsom, um, especially Elijah, who said, Coach said I couldn't be on social media. So it's like... Right. Well, and if I you look it? at Sex State, you don't see a lot of their players. That's Same right. thing. You don't right. see a lot of their players. Again, what, you know, sometimes, you know, what do they say? It's like you, you don't respond to something when you're emotional, and that's exactly what sometimes happens. And I don't blame people for that, but I think that that forming brain that we know isn't formed until it's... 25 some even later mm -hmm. um i think that th w this is like can be very dangerous because right. putting it out there and we all know we think things that we shouldn't but the ability to put it out to the world wide web is where it gets dangerous all right well thank you um kelly and give coach my best and give my boys the best and thank you. tell your daughter i said hello thank you all right board member hoover uh, not really a lot of questions. Thanks for, for doing this. I mean, I, I think, you know, there's so much that we, uh, I think, got excited about social media and the benefits of it when it was, you know, newly released. And over the last decade or so, you know, there were a lot of positives. And, and since that time, we've started to realize the actual negatives, too. And I think, I mean, obviously, you're talking about uh, a host of different things. But when it comes to social media, I do think we're going to look back and kind of question some of uh, our choices in terms of uh, <laughs> to the point that it got. Um, I, I did want to ask, I mean, I know we've talked a lot on this board about cell phone policies. There are a number of schools uh, and school districts across the state that are moving towards more stringent cell phone policies, meaning, you know, whether it be Yoder pouches or, uh, you know, requiring school phones to be off during the school day or left at home. Um, it is becoming more common. Um, is, is that a remedy that you would would support, or do you think this is more of a uh, we need to instill the right, you know, uh, 
techniques or, or advice into our kids so that they can be responsible on their own? I worry about that only because I'm not sure you would have parents that would agree to that because so many parents want to immediately check on their kid. And I think that parents want that connection. And I think that for safety reasons or whatever, I think that there's a struggle for parents on that. There was a big push on the Today Show. It's called Wait to Eight. And they, the Today Show was actually doing this whole push about waiting to give cell phones until kids are in eighth grade. And I think that is probably a better route to go would be to encourage, like, wait to eighth grade, wait to that age. And if you could get people to really buy into that, waiting for that age when they're a little bit more, you know, a little bit more brain developed than a second and third and fourth grader that's walking around with a cell phone. I think that that approach would probably be better. I think we can encourage and you can teach that. And, and I, but I don't think that forcing kids, I think you would have parent pushback because so many parents, they want to immediately connect to their young people. Yeah. There are landlines still, right? Oh, anyway. My parents have one. <laughs> um, you know, and you bring up really quickly, you bring up that, you know, the phone, I want to just say, you know, anything is good in smaller amounts. Sure, but sure. anything that when we're talking about the excessive level, like what we're talking about, where some kids are have that excessive, that's when it hits to that dangerous. It's okay to watch TikTok or to, you know, scroll on your Facebook or to do all that stuff. It's totally fine. It's when it's excessive. Yeah. Right? It's like steak is good, but you don't eat it every is, day. Is that it's, in many ways, I think it's designed to be addictive. I mean, it's not, it's, it's not, you know, kids aren't just getting addicted to it, you know, because of their choices. They're getting addicted to it because it's designed to keep you engaged. Right. right. Watch The Social Dilemma. Right, exactly. Right? That's so. a movie they should show in middle schools, I think. <laughs> they should show it to them because I don't think they realize how on the backside of yeah. it is about yeah. trying to hook you in. Sure, totally. So, well, thank you. That's it for me. Thanks. Um, I'm curious, uh, some countries, I think France is one of them, actually prohibits cell phones in schools. Have they started to have quantifiable data on how that has impacted the students and whether uh, the quality of the education, the performance, social management type of, of uh, skills have, have improved? no change or even diminished? Do, are those studies out there yet? I have not seen those studies. So I do not know that. Um, I mean, I think if you get a whole country behind it, that's really powerful, Yeah. right? It's, it's just hard when you're a school trying to do it and everybody else is not. And yet, though, the California legislature in 2018 or 19, uh, did pass a law that authorizes California school districts to um, ban cell phones. Uh, it's entirely 100% in the power of the school board to ban cell phones in schools. Um, and some uh, schools have done that. Um, there was uh, actually in the, it was a Diane Sawyer screen time uh, came out in 20, I guess 2018. Um, uh, I, I want to say it's down somewhere near Monterey, maybe it even was Monterey, uh, banned cell phones. And they were going in and having conversations with the students in the high school about um, you know, their reaction to it. And they were interviewing them you know, right before the ban, during the ban, and, and you know, a couple of weeks, months into it. And what was interesting is the students, um, uh, about a month into the ban, said, listen, this was the greatest thing that they've ever experienced. They actually were having meaningful conversations with people that they didn't even know existed before. Um, uh, it, it forced them to come out of their shell and have interaction with, with folks and develop that type of uh, Communica communication skills. Uh, and in uh, the vast majority, there were some who said they wanted it back, but the vast majority were supportive of keeping the ban. Um, and it was right around that same time we revised our board policy. We actually did ban cell phones in grades K through uh, five. And uh, because we saw the creep, we saw the creep coming down grade after grade after grade, cascading lower and lower and lower. We knew it was going to go into elementary. Um, but right now, I mean, I don't know. I, I, I haven't heard anything, uh, any problems in element, any of our elementaries about um, students pulling out their cell phones or anything like that because we just don't allow it. Right. Um, uh, and uh, which, which and, and, you know, to your, your question, we did do a, a survey of the parents when we did launch the, the revised policy because we were wondering, you know, how many parents would 
freak out and oppose, uh, you know, I have to have contact. And we were actually a little surprised. I mean, the, the support uh, for a ban was significantly high. Um, and I think it probably diminished as the age of the kids increased. But, you know, I, I sometimes wonder, based on what we're hearing in the middle schools in particular, if we, we should have gone higher. Um, you know, I, I mean, I, I think this wait to eight, I hadn't heard that, but I think there's a lot of truth to uh, delaying until the mind matures a little bit more. Granted, I mean, we're, all of our minds are, well, I guess they say up to 22, but I feel like I'm learning something new every day. So um, I, I don't think, uh, you know, your mind is, 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 and your brain is constantly um, developing, evolving. Uh, so. But you know, it just—it really begs the question that, first of all, it's clear that that cell phones are disruptive to the classroom. I mean, we put a lot of responsibility on teachers to begin with, and you know, in addition to that, we're going to have to have them be the phone police and having to you know enforce our district policies relating to cell phones. And we know that it's disruptive to the school environment. I mean, you, you said it yourself. I mean, I, I find it myself, if my phone buzzes or, or beeps, you know, the temptation is, to, and even it's, 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 it's unconscious. You just naturally go for it. You don't even realize you're doing it until you're, you know, you're, it's in your hand and you're like, oh, you know, how did this phone get in, get in your hand? And it's the same thing that we're seeing in the classrooms from what I understand. That the students, you know, the teacher is lecturing and all of a sudden there's a beep and the student just reaches for it and pulls it out in the middle of class and not even hiding it. They just pull it out. I mean, that's very disruptive to the class environment and that's very disruptive to the learning environment. And we are a school district that our mission is the education of our students. So why are we allowing a technology that's, that's interfering with the primary mission of our students, which is to educate them? I mean, are we not falling short on our responsibility as a school district? I, I know it's, it's a difficult, difficult conversation. Um, but, you know, I mean, you mentioned a couple of things. You mentioned, you know, heightened depression, heightened um, uh, um, or impact on grades, uh, uh, impact on anxiety, um, suicide, uh, eating disorders. Uh, I, I mean, the list goes on and on. I mean, just one of those, a bullying, just one of those items should be enough for people to say, we got, what if, if we weren't talking about cell phones and we said, we have a cure, we have something that's going to improve grades, reduce anxiety, reduce suicide, um, improve grades, improve uh, uh, self-confidence, improve communication skills, are you interested? I think every parent would be, yeah. I mean, even students would probably be, yeah. Until you mention, well, it involves letting go of your cell phone. <laughs> not, not, not like permanently. I mean, you can do with your cell phone what you want when you're home. But just, just in the confined hours of school, and then all of a sudden, no. I mean, that's a real problem. And I'm not convinced that our board policy goes far enough. And I still think we need to revise it. Further. I think on the younger, I, I think that for the, like you said, to the younger, like a K-5, okay. I know as somebody who had high schoolers, one of the important things that they did use it for was homework connection. And I think that there are some, you know, at, for the high schoolers, there's a big plus with being able to yeah. connect for the homework part. I think the K-5 part, absolutely. Because I don't think that there's anything that a third, fourth, or fifth grader needs that can't be offered within their school. Right. And I think that is I, absolutely. I think, I mean, but you're also seeing, again, you have parents that are saying, I want to have that phone so I can ask them where they're at or how can I pick them up or things like that. The one thing that I think you would want to be careful of is if you ban them, you don't want it to become something that, you know, at a young age, they start having their kids be sneaky. And I think you have to be careful of that. Because unfortunately, there are parents that aren't going to support that. Yeah. yeah. So I think you just have to find that harmony and recognizing, you know, for the high schoolers, it has this kind of meaning. But for a K-5, I don't think there's any reason uh, a young up till 10 years old would need a cell phone. What about middle school? I think middle school, you just have to really work at educating and educating and educating them. And like I said, the you know, they have the wait to eight, which is, which is a great, I think there's a great philosophy about that. But I know a lot of people that, I think one of the most common times people do give their kids a phone is in sixth grade when they start. I think that's probably one of the most common times. It's a graduation gift for, uh, or promotion gift for fifth right. grade. So that's yeah. a, I think that's a super common 
uh, thing that happens is they give it at that point because you're talking about a time period when at that point they're losing a lot of you know control as far as like knowing where they're at and so they're having their phone connection so I think I think in middle school, I think you just start really educating and educating and educating them and trying to get parents on board with with having no electronic time at home and you know setting setting an hour aside or finding a show or playing a game or really trying to to educate our kids and our parents just that it, you know again anything in excess is not going to be good for us. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I know, especially in middle school, it seems to be probably where we hear a lot of it as well. But I mean, you know, I mean, we've had examples of teenage middle school boys going uh, out on the playground and watching pornography during lunchtime. Mm -hmm. Is that acceptable behavior? Is that something we want to encourage? Is that something we want to just turn a blind eye to and say, well, it is what it is and throw up our hands and say, well, I give up. What else are we going to do? I mean, I, I, I think there's another solution and we have to figure it out. Maybe there's not a perfect solution. Maybe it's something that we just have to keep on tweaking. Nothing dramatic, but keep on tweaking to just try to stay up uh, and, and improve things in, in, in small increments. And maybe we'll get somewhere in the future that we're like, we're in a good place. We'll find that harmony. Well, I've heard of time. some schools that's just, that have done like, you know, like a, a phone free Friday morning. Yeah. And so asking kids to turn off their phones from, you know, 8 a.m. till 12 p.m. and to walk around, you know, I have my thing that I talk about like eyes up, right? You should learn, walk around with your eyes up, be somewhere with your eyes up. You never know who you're gonna meet or talk to. And that's, that's my little push is eyes up. I'm always saying that. And so if we could start, you know, maybe it, it's more just starting in small increments. Maybe everybody turns off their phone for four hours on a Friday and they walk to class and they see eyes and they start noticing people that they've never noticed because they're on their phones. Maybe it's done in smaller increments, but at that point people can start to realize, hey, there are some pros to, to putting my phone down for a little bit. Yes, and maybe it's something that we can partner with SAB on for some of these education or even, you know, some of these challenges, you know, like uh, phone free Friday morning or something like that. I mean, that might be something that that we could, you know, f work with you folks on as well. But anyway, just an idea. All right. Um, I know we have more things to do. So I, I just really much uh, appreciate everything you do and, and the message that you, you provide. You did a wonderful presentation at Sutter Middle School. I think it was close to a two-hour presentation. I mean, all there was a couple speakers. But, um, you know, it's a conversation we just need to continue. Uh, understanding that there may not be an ideal solution and something that we have to just keep on working at. And... and and that's that's okay and helping our parents know that it's okay to have hard conversations and it's okay to be the bad guy sometimes but if we're asking our young people to do it we have to do it as well uh, mr. Thank president yeah. um, Kelly uh, another quick question um, I know you did it at Sutter are you planning on is this an annual thing that we're gonna be doing we, we've been doing this yes and we'll yeah. probably continue I, I don't know if you we've got you scheduled yet but I if we don't we will <laughs> Well, what's the possibility of having having it in Rancho, maybe alternating sites? Maybe have it at we'll Mitchell with or our team. I'm looking for or actually yeah. using the pack would be great. I mean, it's so underutilized, yeah. and not only the schools but maybe the community, and have them out. So, just a thought. Can I make a comment as well, please? Yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you again for your presentation. Um, I kind of just want to offer an alternative perspective. And obviously, my experience as an individual um, is not every young person's. Um, but I think for uh, from my perspective, I think the internet has offered me a wealth of opportunities and resources. And I think that um, a lot of my peers share the same sentiment. Um, to name a few, I think our students benefit from access to scheduling, research, um, and connection. And I think a lot of the time, these conversations about cell phone use come off kind of um, disconnected from our actual reality as teenagers. Um, like we're using the internet um, as some big scary place where we're, you know, sexting and talking to strangers on the internet. Um, and while I'm sure that's true for some students, um, and many of us young people actually do benefit greatly from having access to such a wealth of information and connection. Um, I personally have found it value um, in the communities that I've gained online, whether it be the coalition of youth I met through social media that I started my community-based organizing with, or the other student board members that I communicate with regularly that I met through the internet. Um, and while I'm sure internet access is linked to our mental health 
health, we as young people are also struggling to adapt to a range of unique challenges that cannot be compared to the generations that come before us. Um, and in fact, as someone who struggles with my own mental health, I think that the internet has been really valuable in coping, um, whether it be access to telehealth or online therapy, um, to online mental health resources. And for youth who may not have conversations about mental health at home or within their cultural norms, the internet is really important. So I think to really reach youth um, and prioritize their mental health and technology use, um, we might need to see the internet from their perspective um, because the internet is a part of our lives as young people regardless. Um, and I think that removing their access to it at school is just gonna make them more disconnected from their school culture and climate. So thanks. And I think you bring up great points. I think that what needs to be recognized is every person is different. And I think that that component, and every person has different circumstances, and every person also has a different predisposition towards addiction. So while one person might not be easily addicted to something, somebody else might have a predisposition towards being heavily in it, addicted to it. So each person's different. And I think you bring up great points about telehealth and scheduling. And, and by no means am I saying that I think cell phones are a bad thing. I'm saying that we have to work to harmonize and to have a balance where people learn how to manage without them and where they learn how to have face-to-face uh, -face communication and how to learn how to use their creativity and things like that. And it's about harmonizing it. It's probably also worth noting, uh, maybe it's obvious, maybe it's not, but um, it wouldn't be removing their access to the internet. Um, we issue Chromebooks one-to-one -one for every single student uh, above uh, kindergarten in this district. Uh, students have access to the internet every single day in every single classroom and on their Chromebook. So um, it's, it's not taking away the internet access, it's, it's taking away certain other access. Right, that was not, the intent is not to take away the internet. The intent is to help people become aware of the internet addiction that we have going on that is creating a negative climate for so many young people. Right, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, uh, let's see, that moves us to pu public comments. Uh, we have some cards here. All right, uh, first uh, public comment is uh, Patricia Hughes, uh, followed by uh, Joanne Perez, and then someone didn't put their name on one. But um, we'll start with uh, Patricia Hughes, please. Hello, everyone. My name is Patricia, and I'm an educator at a local preschool. I have three key points I wanted to address. One, I would like to inform you that Senate Bill SB 866, which would allow minors ages 15 and up to receive any vaccine at their school, has been terminated. Just a reminder, we are pro-vaccine, but we are anti-mandate. Two, after reading through the COVID-19 safety plan for FCUSD, I noticed that there is a COVID-19 te COVID testing plan in place. I just wanted to kindly remind you that children have a 99.997% survival rate. Therefore, it is borderline pointless to continue a testing plan, especially since the CDC now states that those who show no symptoms or have been exposed are not requiring to test no matter their vaccination status. I also would like to see an agenda item added in the next few weeks in regards to an update to the COVID-19 safety plan. And hopefully we can make testing optional, not only for children, but for all the staff and educators. Lastly, please, I ask you to be in support of school choice and not to lose sight of the end goal, which is support the children holistically. What I mean by this is that children should never be seen as a dollar sign when it comes to the public school system. Please let parents uh, make the choices they deem fit for their child's education. And please support the new proposals for New Pacific School and Design Tech High School. Finally, I'll leave you with this quote in honor of Queen Elizabeth's passing today. When life seems hard, the courageous do not lie down and accept defeat. Instead, they are all the more determined to struggle for a better future. Thank you and God bless. Thank you. Okay. Actually, uh, we have, uh, before Joanne Perez gets up, uh, Kenan Peterson. <laughs> so 
sorry. <laughs> so sorry. Uh, good evening, board and uh, uh, Dr. Collegian. Uh, I just wanted to take uh, a moment this evening to uh, express how appreciative I am for the support that's been given to the Mangini Ranch community, uh, the staff, the students, the families, uh, due to the sudden and uh, tragic loss of one of our amazing teachers. And I, uh, the moment of silence was great, so thank you. Uh, with one phone call to Dr. Huber at uh, 5.30 in the morning, which, uh, you know, we call him early, but not at 5.30, um, informing him of the, uh, the situation that we, we received an overwhelming uh, level of support, so thank you. Uh, we received immediate support by 8 o'clock in the morning from Dr. Huber and the mental health specialist. We had 20, 25 people at school at 8 o'clock, so thank you. Uh, Angela and her team supported the communication in, um, that needed to go home to the parents. Um, we've talked about this for years, and, and Angela, um, you guys and your team putting that together was such a huge help, so thank you. Um, ongoing support from Dr. Huber and uh, Angie Carla Magno, stopping by frequently, checking up on myself, uh, the staff, um, and the students. It's been amazing. Uh, Dr. Kligian uh, has stopped by many times to show support for our staff uh, and our team in any needs that we have and upcoming needs, so thank you very much. Um, the SEL support for not only for Ms. Mulder's class, but the entire staff and all of our students has been amazing. Uh, we have received flowers and cards from almost every school uh, and, and, our, and our staff, it's been amazing. Uh, my friend over there, um, uh, Kate Hazarian and her staff, uh, not only supported us at the school, but many of you didn't know that she went over to this grieving family's home and supported them. Uh, Dr. Peace and her team uh, have and will continue to support our school and our needs moving forward. Um, the support that the Mangini community has seen in the wake of this tragic event is truly and simply amazing. Uh, the entire district has come alongside us to support us in any way they can. Um, I am truly humbled, and those of you who know me know that talking in front of a board is not my, one of my strong suits, um, but I am humbled and truly grateful uh, to work in this district and with such caring people that put students, staff, and families first, so thank you. Thank you. And uh, then we have uh, Patricia, he no, uh, Joanne Perez, excuse me. You can change your mind if you don't. I'll make it quick. Okay. <laughs> oh, actually, I, I, you have marked down that you want to speak on charter schools. Yeah, you can wait to that, that agenda item. Okay, thank you. And then uh, we have uh, Lupe uh, Hernandez. It looks like you have two items. Uh, uh, the ADA compliance uh, we can do in, during public comment. The charter school in Rancho Cordova, if you could uh, hold that to um, the charter school item. I have a bit more. I've added two items. I don't listen too well to rules, okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'd like to make a pu public comment, if that's okay. Yeah, please. Thank you. I'd prefer not to be timed as if I'm disabled physically. I'd like to not to be censored or timed. To... Excuse me, I'm talking. My name is Lupe Treviso Hernandez, and I've lived in Ranch Cordova 47 years. Last time I was censored, and I was timed and not allowed to speak beyond that. But I'm a persistent person, and yes, she persisted. My issue here are several things, and the ADA compliance, I ask, because I couldn't get in this building when I visited last time. Last time I couldn't get in the doors because you lock them at five. A public forum and a pu public forum should leave the doors unlocked and inviting to its public. Issue number one, 
Issue number two, do you have a sergeant at arms at all to help individuals in the audience? If not, get one. Thank Another issue, the ADA, the, the ADI, ADA compliance, um, I'd like to see that improved at Old Forsen, at Old Forsen Cordova Unified School District, district buildings and meetings. It needs to be not only to be improved, it needs to be taken seriously. I lost my voice two weeks ago when I was here because a lot of tragedy has happened in my life since then. And I've been screaming and crying since then. And it's not because of you or anybody. It's because there has been tragic episodes that have happened in our community in Ranch Cordova in relation to safety and in relation to schools across the street from our parks. And I'd like to remind all schools I'd like for schools to be reminded that all schools in Ranch Cordova have a joint use agreement with Cordova Recreation and Park District and their principals need to get on board and understand what that means. Because the principal at Ranch Cordova Elementary were the attempted kidnapping, not the incident, but the attempted kidnapping of a child happened earlier in August, okay? So the thing of it is, is that when I visited the principal at Ranch Cordova Elementary within five minutes that she gave me, what happened was that she said, I don't want anything to do with that park. She doesn't have a choice. We have a joint use agreement, okay? She does not have a choice. Neither do any of the other principals in our school district. Get on board, people. If you don't know about that, get on board. I asked Board members that have reached out to me, they're familiar with it. So why isn't it happening in our schools? Safety at Ranch Cordova schools is number one. Why? Because it was an attempted kidnapping and the dog mauling that happened to a woman in our community. Yes, in Ranch Cordova, across the street from a school, there was a dog mauling. The woman had chunks of her flesh ripped from her body, 27 stitches, and she lasted eight hours at UCD Medical Center trying to get her body back to the other again with her husband there until three in the morning. He didn't get home until three in the morning. Can you uh, please wrap up? Because of my inability to speak, I, I have asthma, I have hidden disabilities that you're not familiar with. I, if you I, want me to elaborate, I will. All right. Um, I'll wrap up. Thank you. I, I think that the word immigrant on the safety discussion that this lady d talked about, I think immigrant is the wrong choice of word to be used in a situation like that, I think the more appropriate word would be ignorant or innocence, not immigrant. Immigrant refers to people, people that come as newcomers to this country, okay? Another point I'd like to make. We really need to, to move on. I'd like to ask why it, these students that are here, are they Folsom and Cordova? Is that what it is? I'm asking a question. We don't entertain uh, okay. in cross-direction I'd like to ask Kenny High School to be represented at the table. As in the 90s, we had a Kenny High School student represented at the table. Joey Gamble from Kenny High School represented very well. He is now a union member with Regional Transit and a very educated young man. All right. Thank well, you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I know when my time's up. Thank you. All right, uh, let's see. Do we have any uh, comments on? Yes, we do. Okay, uh, please. The first one is Vazu. Welcome, Vazu. Vazu? Hello, can you guys hear me? Yep, yeah, we hear you. 
I, I was, it was not letting me unmute. Um, hi, hello everyone. Um, I did join the last board meeting also, and I'm joining again. It's about the school bus uh, to Manjini Ranch uh, area. So the director is not being uh, a, of uh, any help. I've tried to reach multiple times, left messages. He never got back to me. So my son, when he gets onto the bus, it takes about one and a half hour to get to the school in the morning. It doesn't make sense to get onto the bus because he reaches the uh, uh, school very tired to start with. You don't want a kid to start like that. We, we moved to Polson just because of the schools and now it's causing a big issue for me for his schools. So I, I, I've already raised my concern last uh, meeting and nothing has been taken. You know, no one got back to me or anything. And then this is not helping out. And the, they say they, they are providing the bus to ease because there are too many students, but that doesn't mean the student has to travel one and a half hour one way. And then even in the, while coming back, it's taking so long. If the buses are not optimized, the routes, then what's the point in having multiple buses? Because that's not the way you want a kid to start a day. Because that, I came back to this meeting again just to make tell you that nothing has been done. And I don't know what's going on. Uh, there's no response from the board, uh, the, the transportation director. And this is, uh, I don't know how, if someone can help us. Because, you know, um, the whole point that I came to Fols move to Folsom is because of the schools. And now schools are becoming a big issue for us. Because the travel and everything, it's not helping out. So I, I, I would really appreciate if you guys can help me out with this. It's not just me. There are many other students who... and. Superintendent, um, I, I assume we have uh, that individual's contact information. Can we have someone reach out to him? We we have, and we will again. Okay. Yes. Thank you. All right. Uh, next speaker. Next, we have Sergio. Welcome, Sergio. Yes, uh, I'm a parent of uh, a, a daughter uh, at Mills and a, a son at uh, Cordova Villa. Had a question. Also, uh, Jim Snow is doing a great job with the transportation department. And uh, we just had a question about, um, has the district um, done anything or um, kind of, uh, let's see, uh, remedied the driver shortage? And um, uh, with with that also, um, has there been any talks of um, uh, adding more routes to, um, to the area? Uh, more stops, I'm sorry. Um, the, the board can't uh, engage in, in back and forth on uh, during public comment, but I think uh, that's a topic that uh, district staff uh, is and continues to evaluate. Um, uh, perhaps if you wanted to call the office tomorrow morning, and who, who should he speak with? He can reach out to Mr. Martin, and we are going to be giving the board an update on transportation in October at the board. Okay. All right, so uh, maybe uh, contact Mr. Martin uh, tomorrow, um, Sean Martin, uh, and uh, hopefully the issue will be resolved before uh, the October meeting. So, yeah, thank you. Uh, next speaker. That's it. That's it, okay. All right, uh, that finishes public comments. Uh, and that moves us on to, I think my sheet is cut off, but I think, uh, oh, there it is. Uh, yeah, uh, reports to district organizations. Uh, the first uh, student advisory board. Our very first student advisory board meeting was this Wednesday. We met our SAB members and also had the opportunity to have several present amazing presenters at our meeting. Our members portrayed an interest in all the information being provided, such as district committees and our annual SAB project. Most importantly, our representatives showed a strong interest in advocating for the implementation of an ethics study course for the 2023-2024 school year throughout our schools which we will all continue to advocate for until it gets approved for further implementation. We continued to discuss future agenda items and collected their input on topics related to their school sites. We also hosted an SAB secretary election and are still recruiting representatives from Mitchell, Sutter, and Walnutwood. Ultimately, we are looking forward for our next meeting on October 5th. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is uh, the California School Employees Association. Welcome, Rob. 
Good evening, President Reed, board members, Dr. Kligian. Uh, first, regarding our compensation tentative agreement, we are very happy we got there. So, um, yay! <laughs> <laughs> Um, CSEA fought hard for our members and Mr. Ogden and Mr. Martin fought hard, equally hard, to achieve the district's goals. Um, we believe the, the agreement is in the best interest of our members and in the best interest of the district. So we ask that you approve the agreement. Um, I will hold my comments regarding uh, Design Tech High School MOU and New Pacific uh, School Petition till later. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, next is the Folsom Cordova Education Association. I assume they're online. Um, I believe we have someone virtually joining us. Good Michelle. evening, Dr. Cleegan, okay. President Reed, and fellow trustees. This is Debbie Krikorian from FCEA giving the report for Angelica tonight. To begin our report, I want to encourage you to support the tentative agreement between FCEA and FCUSD. The TA will help to attract and retain teachers at FCUSD. In addition to compensation and benefit changes, FCEA is excited about collaborating with FCUSD to create a new salary schedule for special education teachers. Together, we have been working on a solution for the past five years to help attract and retain quality special education teachers. The TA places FCUSD at the forefront of the local area in creating an ongoing solution for SPED teachers through a higher paying salary schedule with additional compensation for retirement. So please vote yes in approving the FCEA, FCUSD, TA tonight. In addition, FCEA offers congratulations to our fellow brothers and sisters of CSEA on their agreement with FCUSD as well. The second part of the report has to do with the new Pacific Charter School. At FCUSD, the word collaboration is often used as different challenges are tackled by multiple groups of employees. We must keep collaboration in mind as we continue to support one another to find educational solutions. We ask that you listen to the research done by the staff at your request. You hired the superintendent who has a team of professional educators capable of doing the heavy lifting. In hiring Dr. Kligian, you have placed your trust in her to lead the educational system, which each member oversees as one collective school board. She has the respect of her colleagues as superintendent of the year and should have support as an outstanding educational leader. I challenge each of you to show confidence in the leaders you appoint as the Yuba City School Board demonstrated earlier this month in making their decision on the new Pacific Charter application. Their trustees listened to the research of the staff they support and voted to deny the application. A vote against the staff recommendation is a signal of lack of faith in the educational system, which each member of the board have created and supported collectively. Parents and families vote members onto the school board to make sure that educational leaders are honorable and revered by their elected school board members. <coughs> The other ask is that each member respect those who re represent the people of the affected areas of the petition charter. Your job is to appreciate each other and the boundaries of the districts represented as a whole. If the charter were applying to the Folsom area, I would expect all Rancho Cordova representatives would recognize the desire of the Folsom voters who place board members of Folsom into the office. They are responsible for representing the interests of their home community. In retrospect, Folsom trustees should listen to the representatives of Rancho Cordova to follow the, de the desires of their voters. This action is creating a collaborative partnership with board members representing their district as a whole. I ask again, listen to those you employ, I'm sorry, listen to those you employ and your peers and trust that they know their research and their community. Revere their decisions with the courtesy of showing your support by following their recommendations. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we have the Folsom Cordova Leadership Association. And this evening, their presentation was the school presentation, as it will be the first meeting of each month. Okay. 
Uh, and then finally, we have the District English Learners um, Advisory Committee. And I believe Ms. Cabrera is joining us virtually. I think actually, because Ms. Cabrera had a conflict, um, I was just to report out that there is no report this evening. Okay. All right. Uh, that takes us to agenda item 10, agenda consent. Is there a motion uh, to approve the agenda? I'll move it. A motion by Mr. Clark. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Hoover. Uh, Superintendent. Yes. Ms. Mr. Reed. Aye. Mr. Hoover. Aye. Mr. Clark. Aye. Mr. Short. Aye. Mr. Huey. Aye. Ms. Perez. Aye. Ms. Shrastev. Aye. Motion carries 5-0. Thank you very much. And that was a big vote. It that was a big vote. You approved all of the tentative agreements for all of our labor unions. And let's give them all a round of applause. Thank you. And I, I believe we also have uh, introduction. We do. Also, the board approved the personnel action form tonight, and we have a new uh, administrator that we'd like to introduce to our board and community. Folsom Cordova is pleased to welcome Ms. Shannon Diaz as our new director of compliance. And just a few words about Ms. Diaz. She is a seasoned veteran of education law. Ms. Diaz comes to us from the law firm of Lozano Smith, where she has served as a paralegal. While there, she performed a wide range of legal research and analysis regarding various topics impacting local education agencies. Her vast experience and knowledge of legal requirements and compliance will support FCUSD schools, programs, and staff. In addition to over 20 years working in the legal field, Ms. Diaz also holds a multiple subject teaching credential, a Bachelor of Arts degree in child development. So her unique blend of legal knowledge and educational training makes her a wonderful fit for this role. Congratulations and welcome aboard, Shannon. Thank okay. you. Introduction and warm welcome. I'm excited to become part of the Folsom Cordova district team and work collaboratively with the board, district staff, families, and community to ensure legal compliance and carry out the mission of the district. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Was that the only introduction? Yes. Okay. Yes, All thank right. you. All right, now uh, we move to uh, public hearing item 11, uh, public hearing charter school petition to establish New Pacific School uh, Rancho Cordova. Uh, Superintendent. <clears throat> yes. Um, this evening, this is the second public hearing for New Pacific Charter School. And before Ms. Wessinger starts with our presentation um, for the public hearing, just the logistics. Um, June 23rd was the first public hearing where Dr. Kiefer as the lead petitioner had a chance to um, present on the petition and it was a chance to hear and ask questions at that time. Uh, part of the uh, approval process is to have a second public hearing um, by the district and by the petitioner and then board deliberation after that. So just a little um, introduction here. The board has charged myself, the superintendent, and my staff to do a thorough analysis of the charter petition. District staff in con consultation with our legal counsel has conducted an extensive review and analysis of the petition and its accompanying exhibits. The district's review team carefully evaluated the legal grounds articulated in California Ed Code 47605 for purposes of determining whether the petition meets the minimum standards for approval. I also met with the lead petitioner, Dr. Kiefer, on July 25th to learn more about the proposed program. Based on the district's comprehensive review of the petition and supporting documents, as well as the information received during the public hearing held on June 23rd, while the petition addresses some of the criteria, it lacks meaningful detail on many of the required areas, as well as the affirmations required by law. These findings are based upon findings of facts through the staff's analysis that Ms. Wessinger will go through in more detail to elaborate on uh, during her presentation. Uh, so uh, at this time, we'll ask Ms. Wessinger to give her presentation, the findings of fact that would uh, support um, the district's recommendation for denial of the petition and the um, specifics of that will be following. Mr. President. Yes. Um, I think we need to follow proper protocol and uh, open. <laughs> there we go. Thank you. <laughs> there we go. Okay, with that, Ms. Wessinger. Thank you. 
Good evening, Dr. Kaligian, President Reed, members of the board, colleagues and community. I'm pleased to present our staff report on the charter petition. And so um, I don't believe I get a clicker, so if, that would be great. That makes it easier, thank you. Okay, so just a little bit of a background. Uh, Dr. Kaligian provided a little bit of this already, but New Pacific School under Pacific Charter Institute submitted a petition to establish a new charter school on June 2nd, 2022. The target students are students coming from Cordova Villa, White Rock Navigator Elementary School, Mills and Mitchell Middle Schools, and Cordova High School. The components of the proposed program include grades served TK through 12 in multi-age classrooms, the educational focus is a trauma-informed SEL framework, and students' standards align curriculum with student-centered academic approach and individual learning growth plans. Pursuant to California Education Code 47605, that sets forth the guidelines to consider in reviewing charter petitions, and I'm going to just go over, the, over them briefly. The governing board of the school district shall not deny a petition for the establishment of a charter school unless it makes written factual findings specific to the peti this particular petition setting forth specific facts to support one or more of the following findings. One, the charter school presents an unsound educational program for the pupils to be enrolled in the charter school. Two, the petitioners are demonstrably unlikely to successfully implement the program set forth in the petition. Three, the petition does not contain the number of signatures required by statute. Four, the petition does not contain an affirmation on each of the conditions required by statute. Five, the petition does not contain reasonably comprehensive description of the 15 required elements. Six, the petition does not contain a declaration of whether or not the charter school shall be deemed the exclusive public employer of the employees of the charter school. Seven, the charter school is demonstrably unlikely to serve the interests of the entire community in which the school is proposing to locate. Analysis of these findings shall consider uh, fiscal impact uh, and uh, whether the proposed charter school would substantially undermine existing services or whether it would duplicate a program currently offered. So we have divided our findings into two categories areas considered met and areas considered significantly deficient and supporting denial. And I will start with the areas that have been considered met. Hmm. Here we go. I'm sorry, I'm gonna start with my summary of finding. I just got my pages out of order, I apologize. So we're, I'm gonna start with the findings following a comprehensive review and analysis of the petition by FCUSD staff, which included over 20 of our staff and um, district council. Denial of the petition is recommended based on the following findings of fact. Finding of fact number one, New Pacific School is demonstrably unlikely to successfully implement the program set forth in the petition. And number two, the petition does not contain an affirmation of each of the conditions required by statute. And number three, the petition does not contain reasonably comprehensive descriptions of the required elements of a charter petition. And number four, New Pacific School is demonstrably unlikely to serve the interests of the entire community in which the school is proposing to locate. Analysis of this finding shall include consideration of the fiscal impact of the proposed charter school. So areas considered met. You can see that there are quite a few of the elements that are considered met, and I won't spend time um, describing these areas. Areas considered significantly deficient. I won't read through each of these because I will provide descriptions of the findings as I go through the analysis. So beginning with finding number one, New Pacific School is demonstrably unlikely to successfully implement the program set forth in the petition. Uh, specifically, New Pacific School has not demonstra demonstrated they can support target students. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about the instructional framework. So first of all, uh, Pacific Charter Institute and schools serve fewer socioeconomically disadvantaged English learners 
homeless, and students with disabilities than Folsom Cordova Unified School District, and the academic outcomes are not better than the academic outcomes at the target schools, Cordova Villa, White Rock Navigator, Mitchell Mills, and Cordova High School. There's no evidence that the instructional framework was developed to meet the needs of target students. Individual growth plans are part of the framework, but the framework does not address how tiered interventions will be implemented with multi-age and grade for in a project-focused program. Petition states students will work on goals at home to catch up. This is not best practice. Instruction should occur within the school day with certificated teachers. New Pacific School does not utilize state adopted curriculum. Curriculum alignment to common core standards is difficult to achieve when a school develops their own curriculum. When we look at the academic outcomes, Pacific charter schools are significantly lower in their proportion of socioeconomically disadvantaged enrollment when compared to Folsom Cordova Unified School District schools. Folsom Cordova Unified School District comparison schools in Rancho Cordova outperformed the most comparable charter school, Rio Valley, at five of nine sites for English language arts and at all sites for math, taking the Pacific Charter School with the closest compositional match for English learners to Folsom Cordova Unified School District comparison schools. Seven of the 11 Folsom Cordova Unified School District schools have a higher average of ELA scores. When looking at the comparison schools, the comparison schools for Folsom Cordova are Cordova Meadows, White Rock Cordova Villa, Mills, Rancho Cordova Elementary, Cordova Gardens, Cordova High School, and Mitchell. The comparison schools for New Pacific are Rio Valley, Heritage Peak, Valley View, and Sutter Peak. Folsom Cordova Unified School District staff provided multiple factual findings outlined in the staff report pages 8 through 13 and reached a reasonable conclusion in reviewing the new Pacific School response to Folsom Cordova Unified School staff report. Staff's recommendation does not change. However, upon review of the new Pacific response and after further review of the petition, staff is satisfied that a reasonable description of the physical education was provided. Uh, however, does, this does not change our overall finding that, and there are many factors that went into this response. There are, there are other factors that we considered. They're all outlined in the report, and that includes that New Pacific School has no experience in operating in-person educational experience. New Pacific School has poor academic outcomes compared to target schools. New Pacific School has not demonstrated they have served the student groups identified, which are students with disabilities, homeless, socioeconomically disadvantaged students. New Pacific School has not provided a complete description of how instruction methodology will be implemented other than through self-determination, pages 77 and 78 of their petition, which appears to be independent study through web-based platforms. New Pacific School curriculum is not aligned to Common Core standards, as New Pacific School does not use state adopted materials. Tiers of support are not described, and no intervention time is built into the schedule. A, a description of uh, the program, how the program will be implemented is not described, and um, attendance, how attendance concerns will be addressed is not described. Uh, identified in the petition as well. Staff finding number two, the petition does not contain an affirmation of each of the conditions required by statute. There are three affirmations that are not provided. The first one is affirmation that admission to charter school shall not be determined according to the place of residence of the pupil. A further review of the uh, petition and of this area is a finding that um, under this affirmation, it was a, not a complete affirmation, but the language that is missing in the report is that uh, um, staff, that the affirmation regarding existing public school converting to partially or entirely to a charter school is not required. So in regard to affirmation one, um, district staff would agree that that's met as that language is not required. However, affirmation two regarding teacher credentialing is not met. And affirmation number three, an assurance that the enrollment procedures are not likely to be negative, to negatively impact the racial, ethnic, and unduplicated balance the charter schools strive to reflect. So in regard to teacher credentialing, there's a 
there's a really uh, material disagreement in how the um, law is applied. And um, it's the district's uh, view and council's view that um, there is no exemption for teachers who are, were employed by a charter school in 2019-20. And, uh, and then in regard to the insurance that, assurance that enrollment procedures are not likely to negatively impact the racial, ethnic, and unduplicated balance, the charter school in their response contend that they've met this ed code requirement because they cite that they will follow the specific ed code. However, they don't call out the, um, the, the enrollment how the enrollment preferences do not impact the enrollment for access for the specific pupils who are described in the ed code, which are pupils with disabilities, academically low achieving pupils, English learners, neglected or delinquent pupils, homeless pupils, or pupils who are economically disadvantaged. And staff feels that this language is very important that it is a requirement because these are the students who um, our, our disadvantaged youth, our, our underserved youth, our outpromised youth, and that we're making efforts to serve them and we want to make sure that when we are thinking about our enrollment policies that we're thinking specifically about these students. Finding, in fact, number three, the petition does not contain reasonably comprehensive descriptions of all of the required elements, starting with description of vision, mission, and the educational program. The enrollment capacity is not provided, and while not legally required, it is reasonable to request and have this in the petition, the enrollment. It's really difficult for staff to make an analysis when they don't know what the enrollment will be. The, the district uh, analysis would look very different if the enrollment is capped at 500 versus if it's capped at 2,000 students. It affects our fiscal analysis, facility plannings, et cetera. Um, it, the, the next element that's not met is measurable student outcomes. And the measurable student outcomes are uh, described in the LCAP, which is included in the petition. And while in the uh, report that, um, that New Pacific, their response to our report states that they do provide uh, the correct um, outcomes, that they have student outcomes and measurements. When you read through each of the priorities, they cited an example of a priority that, that was met. But um, in, for example, in state priority two, sub -pri uh, priorities A, B, and C, there are no actions and the measurable outcomes are neither measurable or an outcome. The action to achieve the goal, page 101, that, that they're um, describing, annual improvement as measured in, I'm sorry, let's see, as annual improvement as measured in SBAC um, constitutes an outcome. However, it is not a measurable outcome. The measurable outcome, page 101, the charter school will measure using funds spent on CCS and NGSS. Uh, instructional materials is curriculum embedded, is um, not a measurable outcome. Um, under state priority five, petitioner's response points out that state priority five, sub priority A has an appropriate goal. However, sub, sub priorities B, C, D, E are noted incorrectly, i.e. outcomes are not measurable. FCUSD staff found concerns with state priority two, sub priorities A, B, C, state priority four, sub priorities A, B, C, D, state priority five, sub priority B, C, D, E, state priority six, sub priorities A, B, C, state priority seven, sub priority A, um, so that's the concerns under the measurable student outcomes. In regard to qualifications to be met by individuals employed by the charter school, I mentioned this a few minutes earlier. It's the credentialing requirement where we have the concern and the, uh, the fundamental disagreement between what uh, district staff feels is interpretation of the statute versus what New Pacific believes is interpretation of the statute. Um, health and safety procedures are incomplete. They don't meet the ADA requirements. The financial and um, administrative plan is lacking. Um, the cash flow is combined. P New Pacific School Rancho Cordova cash flow is combined with other schools. Um, and uh, the insurance rates are lower than recommended by our Joint Powers Authority. And uh, as I mentioned, the total enrollment is not provided, which affects um, impacts our findings. Uh, facilities were have been identified, but it's difficult for us to evaluate the compliance with the building, and so that is incomplete at this time. Special education services and staffing are um, unclear. 
that concludes uh, the findings of fact on finding three. And then under finding number four, New Pacific School is demonstrably unlikely to serve the interests of the entire community in which the school is proposing to locate. So under here, we will talk about um, the community impact, which will incorporate a fiscal impact that results in substantially undermining existing services, academic offerings, or programmatic offerings in Folsom Cordova Unified School District, the duplicity in the proposed program, and then the district's capacity to serve our students. So starting with the fiscal impact, if we look at the first three years of New Pacific School in operation, years 20, starting with 23, 24, 24, 25, and 25, 26, we um, have uh, the enrollment, these enrollment figures are included in the petition. So these figures are based on the numbers provided of 100 students in the first year, 187 in the second year, and 212 in the third year. If we look at the net loss of enrollment at the, as all of the students enrolled in New Pacific School coming from Folsom Cordova, the, first, the figures are uh, the, the net loss. So this takes into consideration the staffing reductions that we, the expenses and staffing reductions we would need to make. The net loss in year one would be 652,961. In year two, 1,262,863. In year three, 1,595,293. And then if we look at it with just a 50% enrollment loss, so we make the assumption that New Pacific Charter School enrollment is based on 50% of the students coming from Folsom Cordova Unified School District and the other 50% coming from other school districts. In year one, the, the net loss is 326,481. In year two, it's 631,432. And in year three, it's $782,646. So you can see what the, the uh, estimated cumulative loss here is at the bottom of the slide. And this is based on an average daily attendance rate of 95%. So the cumulative loss to the district would be between $1,740,000. $559 and $3,481 and $117. The net revenue uh, lost to the district would take a, that would lose over the next three years, as I mentioned, it's $1.7 million to $3.5 million, um, is the equivalent of 20 to 40 FTE of teachers or 28 to 56 FTE of site administrative assistants or 5,000 to 10,000 Chromebooks, or 80,000 to 160,000 hours of yard duty, or 25 to 50 FTE of custodial support, or at 100% loss of 3.48 million, the district will lose the equivalent of 2.66 teachers, 10,600 hours of yard supervision, 3.73 site administrative assistance, 3.33 custodians ongoing and 660 Chromebooks a year. When we look at the uh, the loss of uh, revenue and and uh, um, then we also take into consideration that um, our our anticipated uh, growth south of 50 um, is is reduced in 23-24 due to the the loss of enrollment. So the loss of enrollment offset that uh, has offset some of the um, growth. And then that coupled with the opening of Design Tech High School, which will also impact enrollment. These factors along with an, an approval of New Pacific School would result in declining enrollment and a loss of revenue, which would substantially undermine the existing programs and services in Folsom Cordova Unified School District. Okay, look, moving on to uh, Community, uh, community impact and the, the duplicity of programs. Um, programs and curriculum proposed by New Pacific School as compared to those offered at Folsom Cordova Unified School District. As you can see, doing a side, side by side comparison, New Pacific School is not offering anything unique to what the district is providing. And while it's technically not required in law that they offer something that is unique, um, the offering the duplicity of programs has a, a substantial impact on uh, the district's ability to provide the, the programs. 
Um, there is a link in this presentation to Exhibit A, which provides a multi-page and detailed comparison of the programs and curriculum. Uh, and going back, I do also just want to mention in here the uh, capacity. And so we did look at the capacity of the target schools and all of our target schools, Cordova Villa, White Rock, Navigator Mills, Mitchell, and Cordova High School have the capacity for enrollment. And, um, and also in looking at, in reviewing uh, New Pacific Schools written response to the staff report, um, uh, the staff's recommendation does not change. Folsom Cordova Unified staff provided a thorough analysis with detailed findings. A rational basis exists for a finding that New Pacific School is demonstrably unlikely to serve the interests of the entire community in which the school is proposed. The fiscal impact loss of revenue of 1.7 million to 3.5 million over the next three years, the duplicity in the proposed program which would substantially undermine existing services and the Folsom Cordova Unified School District capacity to serve the students in the um, target schools um, are, uh, would be impacted by uh, the approval of the new Pacific school. Lastly, the, the, in accordance with the California Education Code 47605, the new Pacific school will be afforded the equivalent time to respond to the staff report. Any a member of the public will have an opportunity to voice their input or opinion regarding the petition to establish a new Pacific school and if the Board of Education denies the new Pacific School Charter petition, the proposed charter school may appeal the decision to the Sacramento County Board of Education within 30 days. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wessinger. Should, before we uh, engage in uh, questions, should we have uh, Dr. Kiefer come up and? Yes, yeah, okay. I think that's appropriate. So Dr. Kiefer, welcome. Oh, no problem. Thank you. Actually, I do, but not that one. <laughs> oh, great. Thank you. Yeah, it's a little pithy. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, Board President, Board of Trustees, Superintendent Collegian, staff, uh, and uh, the audience. My name is Paul Kiefer, and I'm the lead petitioner for New Pacific School Ranch Cordova. And I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, I'd like to present an overview of, overview of what our response will be. The re we will be uh, reviewing New Pacific School, what we plan to offer, response to the staff report, and working together to serve students. I think it's important that we go back to what the uh, the law says for charter schools so that we have a clear understanding of what we're trying to achieve tonight. The intent of the Charter Schools Act, which is Ed Code 47601A through G, it is the intent of the legislature to provide opportunities for teachers, parents, pupils, and community members to establish and maintain schools that operate independently from the existing school district structure as a method to accomplish all of the following. And I will read just three. Increase learning opportunities for all pupils with special emphasis on expanding learning experiences for pupils who are identified as academically low achieving. Encourage the use of different and innovative teaching methods. And finally, I'd like to point out E, provide parents and pupils with expanded choices in the types of educational opportunities that are available within the public school system. So in reviewing our organization, uh, as I've been here a few times, Pacific Charter Institute now serves five schools, four that are uh, independent study and homeschool, which has been clearly do uh, noted tonight by staff, and also our fifth school, which started in August, Ro New Pacific School Roseville, which is serving students, uh, at, not as we speak, but certainly now uh, during the school day. Uh, New Pacific School Rancho Cordova is a project-based personalized learning school with Leader and Me framework for social emotional learning at the foundation. The school would open with grades TK5 in the fall of 2023 with 100 students, which was clearly outlined in the charter petition with grades six through 12 phasing in over time. The small by design school will ultimately serve 400 students and offer the only middle school program south of Highway 50 and Rancho Cordova. 
We offer a unique program, hands-on learning, authentic connections, and happy students. As we have seen during the COVID-19 pandemic, there is no one size that fits all and to approach learning. No other school is the same. We appreciate the identification of the things that the district has done well in recent years, but there is no school currently existing in the district that brings personalized learning expertise and strategies to all enrolled students continually from TK to 12th grade in a classroom-based format. Yes, the district positions multiple programs next to a single school. Certainly a student in Folsom with getting social emotional learning is not going to a project-based learning school, uh, perhaps in Rancho Cordova, if they don't offer it at the same school. We have a track record of success, almost 20 years of running schools in uh, 15 counties, serving over 3,000 students now since 2005. We're headquartered in Sacramento, and we have a full cadre of facilities, finance, IT, HR, enrollment, and student-supported services ready to ensure students are successful on day one. And of course, we, as we mentioned before, we have over a $10 million reserve, which will help support this effort. So over the past year, in partnering with FCUSD, we've learned about each, each other through three board meetings, community events, and PCI site visits. We've shared our successes with career technical education, dual enrollment, and graduation and college acceptance. We've highlighted PCI's distinguished board members, including Jean-Paul Prentice, who happens to be here, who is a Rancho Cordova resident and a PCI parent. You've heard from parents and supporters who are excited about New Pacific School Rancho Cordova. And so tonight, we will respond to the staff report, demonstrating that there is no legal basis to deny New Pacific School Rancho Cordova and ask you to approve the school after we have completed tonight's transactions. So there were earlier concerns when we were here before, and one was having a facility. And so we'd like to point out that we took that to heart. And so with that, and working with, uh, working with the city, we overwhelmingly heard there was a demand for choice south of Highway 50. We identified two facility options on the west side of Rancho Cordova, south of 50, and presented them to the development service team at the city of Rancho Cordova. Based on their feedback, a site on Rockingham Drive near Cordova Villa Elementary School appears to be the most suitable, and we've begun talks with the landlord. We are confident that this location will meet the needs of a wide range of students and families. We also heard clearly about chronic absenteeism as a focus, and so with that, New Pacific School is not designed as an alternative school for the specific purpose of serving the chronically absent. For that reason, this petition is more tightly focused on delivering engaging, hands-on, project-based learning to all students. We believe that engaging, personalized nature of our program will result in higher attendance and lower rates of chronic absenteeism as measured by the California State Dashboard, but that is not the focus. And we have also continued our community outreach uh, attending the International Festival, Kids Day in the Park. We've done uh, coffee with the principal on Zoom meetings, and we have had held multiple, uh, well, many, many of those meetings, bubbles and balloons at the White Rock Park, and we've had Russian and Spanish interpreters for the families, so to make sure that we were able to engage in everyone that arrives. As a result of the staff report has validated the parent signatures in support of the petition, and we're confident that there's demand for the program in Rancho Cordova. So back to the intent of the Charter Schools Act, in reviewing petitions for the establishment of a charter schools, the chartering authority shall be guided by the intent of the legislature that charter schools are and should become an integral part of the California educational system and that the establishment of charter schools should be encouraged. So to the findings. We want to thank staff for their district report. We provided a detailed 32-page response to the district on August 23rd. PCI submitted a legally compliant petition. We have experience and resources to implement the program, and we prepared to serve the target student population in Rancho Cordova. The remaining issues in the staff report are either insufficient legal basis to deny the charter petition or operational issues that can be addressed in an MOU. So this uh, did not come out clearly in the staff's report, but what we do know is it is noteworthy that the staff report 
contains no findings that the petition presents an unsound educational program under Educational Code Section 47605C11. That is, there is no disagreement that students of the district would be well served by the academic program presented by the petition. Furthermore, the report does, did not make substantial written findings related to the element A, the description of the mission, vision, and educational program. In fact, this is what sits underneath element A. All of these items actually are agreeable by the district. There's a lot of school information there. Uh, and we've, we've provided 317 pages in this charter petition. So uh, that is a large volume of work to demonstrate something that actually is already existing in Roseville with students and staff. During the previous review, element A was an area considered met. This time the district's sole issue with the district of element A is that it did not include enrollment capacity through the 12th grade. Why is that? The only obligation of the petitioner related to enrollment projections that identified in section 47605H that the petition include financial projections for the first three years of operation. We have no plans of having 12th graders within three years. Therefore, we didn't include 12th grade in the enrollment projections. The staff report does not dispute that the petition includes three years of enrollment projections, at which time New Pacific School will serve students through the ninth grade. That's on page 277. Therefore, there is no legitimate factual finding that New Pacific School educational program isn't reasonably comprehensive or sound. In regards to likely to succeed, the report disregards PCI's extensive experience opening and operating multiple charter public schools, delivering academic results, and serving diverse students is evidence in future success. We have site-based programs. PCI has successfully opened and operated charter school programs that include in-person direct instruction in classrooms. We've had multiple charter renewals. We've been audited. We have academic results. We've done the, uh, uh, we've, we've passed the dashboard by the state of California for all four schools, uh, giving us a five-year renewal our academic success. We stand by the academic outcomes of our schools and continue to see increases in student achievement and graduation rates. And this is where the story gets really interesting because we actually have our scores for Heritage Peak or all of our schools for uh, this year. And I'm sure the district has your scores as well. Um, Valley View Charter School uh, went from 42.72 to 45% uh, from the 2019 to the 2022 uh, scores. Valley View uh, in uh, ELA uh, actually went down a little. It went from 57.5 to 55.97. Sutter Peak Charter School in mathematics grew from 25.84 to 33.1% proficient. Uh, and Sutter Peak in ELA went from 41.61 ELA to 54.45. And remember, this is 2019 to 2022. And Pacific Charter Institute knocked it out of the park with kids in homeschooling and independent study. Rio Valley Charter School, which had been brought up, uh, went from 36.2 to 34.92 in ELA, so it did drop a little bit. Uh, but in mathematics, it went from 17.52 to 17.94. And Heritage Peak, which is a school that serves uh, predominantly Sacramento County kids, or many Sacramento kids, county kids, it went from 35.33 to 45.02 in ELA. And in mathematics, it went from 21.23 to 27.26. I don't know where the district is on this, but I can tell you this much. When I talk about academics that we are discussing right now, we are, we are doing the work that we're being asked to do. Experience serving diverse students. Three of our five existing schools serve a majority of students experiencing social economic disadvantages. We have very similar schools. Heritage Peak is over 50% and so is Rio Valley. New Pacific School Roseville, tonight you'll have a chance to hear from our principal, uh, Eric Garber, who will talk a bit about our school during his time. In regards to affirmations, admission preference for former attendance areas, this does not apply to New Pacific School, and I think uh, staff already con uh, considered this, Rancho Cordova, because it is not a conversion charter. The second one about teacher credentialing, this is not a required affirmation. By law, a charter petition may only be denied if it does not contain an affirmation of each of the conditions described in Education Code 47605, but the affirmation the district criticizes is, in this finding is not one of the conditions described in that subdivision. 
And then admission preferences, this is false. The charter affirms on page nine its preferences for a public random drawing and shall be given and required to Education Code section 47605. It's reaffirmed on page 152 related to admission preferences, which include students with disabilities, academically low achieving pupils, English learners, neglected or delinquent pupils, homeless pupils or pupils who are economically disadvantaged as determined by eligibility for any free or reduced price meal program, foster youth or pupils based on nationality, race, ethnicity or sexual orientation. It was in the charter petition. So the punchline there is, is finding two is not lawful basis for denial of petition, the affirmation. Reasonably comprehensive. The report demands a level of detail not required by the Charter Schools Act and regards reasonably comprehensive programs des descriptions within the charter. A few of the issues raised in this section can, can and should be appropriately uh, addressed in the MOU. PCI has worked collaboratively with five different school districts to meet all of the following through agreements and MOUs. So this is not new to us. And certainly we know we could meet uh, agreement on those and certainly those are a reason for a denial of a charter petition. And then we go to community impact. The fiscal impact is very interesting because the, the description by staff does not include projected enrollment growth numbers for the district for the next three years, does not acknowledge that the district itself is planning to open multiple sites in Rancho Cordova to meet the demand, does not include income to the district from mandatory charter school oversight fees and potential income from the charter buying back services from the district. Uh, and also doesn't uh, acknowledge the growth that's gonna be happening uh, south of Folsom, uh, southern Folsom and certainly in southern Rancho Cordova. Existing services, there would be none given the district's strong cash position. The entire three year enrollment transfer from 100% scenario could be absorbed by less than 7% of the district's unrestricted reserve without any reduction to existing services. And duplication, there is none. There is no other single school site in Rancho Cordova specifically or the district broadly that offers an integrated whole child project-based personalized learning continually in grade TK-12 in a small school environment. There is not one. Or the district would have brought that school forward. Accordingly, finding four provides no factual basis for the denial of the petition under section 47605C7. Community impact. Finally, the fiscal analysis includes under the finding four presents a partial picture as it focuses on the potential for lost enrollment revenue for the district. While the finding site potential costs to the district, they do not account for increased revenues to the district as a result of oversight fees or services. They also fail to consider any positive fiscal impact to the community, including jobs at the charter school, increased traffic to local businesses, and or future earnings of potentially families being served. The worst case scenario is extremely unlikely because the community the school seeks to serve borders Elk Grove and Sac City Unified School District. And so I, I guess I wanna uh, talk just real quickly because we did attend the August 19th um, uh, luncheon at the Cordova Community Council luncheon and, and, and Super, Superintendent Colegan did say significant enrollment increase of approximately 6,000 students over the next 10 years, which will require the construction of at least three new schools. To say, to say on one hand there's that this, the district can't afford it, and on the other hand there's 6,000 new students coming valued at $15,000 a student. That's millions upon millions of dollars. And so we're just trying to make sure we get all the cards on the table in regards to the actual cost of a charter school being uh, coming to Rancho Cordova. So for duplication, the report recites how the district offers elements of the new Pacific School program at different sites. However, the report does not identify a single school. I've mentioned that ad nauseum, and I'm sure you're tired of hearing that. The district cannot deny a charter petition under section 47605C7, absent detail of specific facts and circumstances that analyze whether the proposed charter school would duplicate a program currently offered within the school district and the existing program has sufficient capacity for pupils proposed to be served within reasonable proximity to where the charter school intends to locate. The report's duplicate, duplication analysis is not founded. And so with that, yes, in fact, we all can work together. That is true. Um, this is the hardest part of the job of, of charter schools is being in front of a board who is um, working hard to run the district. But I know that there's a lot that we have in common uh, and the number one thing is children. The standard for approval under the Charter Schools Act, a school district board, 
of education is required to approve a charter petition unless it makes specific written factual findings to support a denial based on the grounds enumerated under section 47605 setting forth specific facts specific to the particular petition before the chartering authority. We believe that uh, although we respect staff, we believe the staff has been flawed. The staff report finding are not valid grounds on which approval for the charter petition may be denied. We provided a stronger petition with uh, 317 pages with much more detail with all the learning that we that occurred from our last petition to, ta to now. The staff report contains no findings of the petition presents an unsound educational program under education code section 47605C11. We are demonstrably likely to succeed as we have already with New Pacific School Roseville. Indeed, the founding leaders are qualified and prepared to implement an innovative educational model that has already garnered significant interest from the families in Rancho Cordova where a demonstrable students need exists for this school. We believe that working together, more time, higher achievement, delivering our personalized learning model into the community. We get, there is a path forward with an MOU and we believe that we could be a, a trusted partner. We have, the, we have the, the expertise and also the will to do that with you. And so with that, if you can uh, turn that on, the video. And this is the first week of school at New Pacific School Roseville. Thank you. All right, uh, why don't we start with uh, board questions? Um, I mean, uh, this is a public hearing. Uh, I mean, we could ask the, the, the questions uh, in the next agenda item, but I think it would probably be more efficient just to get the board questions out now, um, as well as uh, the public comment. And then on the next agenda item, uh, any, uh, I guess, observations or pontification or anything else that the board would like to uh, explain or, or advocate for can be done in the next agenda item, uh, which is uh, approval or denial of New Pacific. So uh, that being said, let's um, uh, well, see if we, the, the students would like to speak first. Um, uh, Board member uh, Rasva, do you have any questions? Yeah, um, I'm, I'm still writing some questions down, so if you could just come back to me, that would be great. Sure, happy thank to. you. Uh, board member Rosie? Right. Not at the moment. Excuse me. All right, um, and then uh, let's see, uh, board member Hui, do you have any questions? I think just a couple. Uh, I suppose the first one, uh, Ms. Westinger spoke about this on page 11 of the staff report. You probably don't need to go there. Uh, that the enrollment capacity is not provided in the petition. Uh, Dr. Kiefer, I noticed uh, on your response, it, I believe it mentioned that 400 students was a, kind of the, what you were looking to achieve ultimately? Yes. Thank you. Uh, and then the only other uh, concern I have is the teacher credentialing concern. Can you maybe speak a little bit to, uh, I know we have a difference of opinion between uh, credentialing of teachers between the district and uh, New Pacific, maybe you can speak to that a little bit. Yeah, I prefer to have council speak because uh, it's complicated. 
Thanks, Dr. Kiefer. Janelle Rooley with the Law Offices of Young Menin Corps. Good evening. I was here last time. Um, the teacher credentialing piece is a little bit complicated. The law changed for charter schools um, in July of 2020, July of 2020, uh, in the post-pandemic, post-shutdowns. Um, before the change, the law said that charter school teachers in core courses, never defined core, but charter school teachers in core courses had to have uh, a teaching credential just like they would in a school district. But then teachers in non-core, non-college prep classes did not have to have a credential. So that's what it used to be. Now it changed to say that all teachers, anybody who has a title of a teacher in a charter school has to be credentialed for their certificated assignment. So they have to be credentialed and assigned correctly, both of those things. Nobody argues about that. The law then goes on to say that if an individual was teaching in a charter school during 1920, the 1920 school year, and they did not have a credential, that person has until July 1 of 2025, so a couple more years from now, to gain a credential to continue teaching in it, it to continue teaching. What I understand the district says is that that exception does not apply to a brand new school. We take the position that it applies to any school because it does not uh, discount any schools. In full transparency, the Department of Education, the Teacher Credentialing Commission, they have a position that's different from ours. You know, I think at the end of the day, uh, Dr. Kiefer, all of his schools are, all of his teachers are properly credentialed. I expect that they would continue to do the same. Okay, uh, uh, board member short. Yeah. Uh, Just a couple questions. Uh, I think that credentialing was one of them, but do, it, it seems like we disagree to uh, disagree on that one. But do you think it's okay to have uncredentialed teachers start off? Every one of our teachers at New Pacific School Roseville is credentialed and appropriately credentialed. So, and we would only hire credentialed teachers. So, um, I think, I think it's. I think it's a non-issue because we agree with we agree with the district. Every teacher will be credentialed appropriately. Okay, so do you do you realize there's a teacher credentialing shortage in California? Where would you find these folks? Yeah, so as I mentioned, uh, New Pacific School Roseville, uh, we we were able to uh, through a large um, a large panel of teachers choose the three best teachers. So we have not had a problem with finding teachers. Uh, on that petition, did you use the same teachers same that you te did same the ones you on this petition? Uh, we actually hired other teachers. Uh, because those teachers uh, didn't want to leave their current assignments, but they were, but they were interested in leaving okay. that assignment. So, if if you can't find teachers, would you be hiring from the district, and would they have reciprocity and same as a union teacher here? Would they be treated equally and equal pay? So, um, I would like to think that our our pay and our benefits are competitive with any school district, and so uh, it would not be equal to the district. It might be higher. Um, After or, we just did a large uh, contract with them tonight, yeah. So we we've, we've been consistently increasing uh, the salaries of our staff over the last three years. So we didn't have a, a an immediate spike or immediate okay. deficit because we've been following our staff's needs and making sure we don't have turnover. Okay. Uh, moving on. Um, you didn't mention. I mean, last time we were talking about location. The last location was um, you know you gave us a vicinity. I know. You don't want to talk about location because you're, you're going to say I'm negotiating and that would be. I'd be willing to talk about location. Okay, so location that I hear is where? Rockingham. Okay, Rockingham. So uh, the only structures I know are there are the old police stations and or that other area in there, and that's a really high traffic area. How would you make a safe schools or route? How would the kids get in and out of there from traffic? So we met with this. We met with the, the city planners, and they felt it was a good location as well, with appropriate fencing, appropriate curbs uh, applied, appropriate traffic flows. They they fully approved that site uh, on um, in regards to moving us to move into the, take us into that direction. So you already have entitlements. No, we haven't. We haven't signed a lease. So they didn't do a traffic study. Uh, we won't need to do a traffic study, most oh. likely, because okay. it's it's uh, already zoned correctly. 
because I know one in Granite Bay. They they approved a charter over there, and it's like forty five minutes. It was it was uh, the, the the city approved a charter, and they didn't do a traffic study, and people are bailing out because it takes forty five minutes to an hour just to get to drop off their kids. Okay. So anyway, those like, you got to look at that location. I just sure, you know, sure. it just seems like that's for a, sure. not Thank a good location. Uh, you know. So anyway, uh, back to the cap. There is no cap. So you're saying you're phasing this again. Is, is it, you're going to still phase the first two to three years, you know, one through three, and then go five years full to, all the way to the K-12? Is that your plan? Yeah, it, it, exactly, that's exactly our plan, is okay. to phase grade levels. Is there anything, I know you always say it's not in the Charter Act. Is there anything in the Charter Act that prevents you from not phasing, just go full boat for right up the first year? Yeah, so... Uh, for us, we realize if we go full boat, you have a lot more uh, liability and risk because you're trying to fill more classrooms than you're targeting. And right. so you'll have to hire more staff trying to reach that level. And uh, so typically, like when a new high school is open, uh, they open with their freshman year and then their freshman, sophomore, and then their freshman. Right. And they do that so that they can uh, not, not have less students than the number of students, the number of students required to support that teaching right. staff. Right. So it's, it's economics. But it can be done. Uh, we do it with uh, independent study and homeschool. We go TK-12 because we know teachers can, can serve students in multiple grade levels. Yeah. So we're not tied to that. Right. So you, you can grow to 1,000, 1,500. Those commercial buildings in those areas range from fifteen to 50,000 square feet. So, you know, 30, 50,000 square feet can be substantially big. So you do? Are you planning to remodel all those things, and where do you get? Where are you going to get all the money to remodel those type of buildings? So that's going to be uh, in millions regards of to how large we're going to get. We see 400 students as like the outside size of what we're going to do, because uh -huh. we don't want a large school that defeats the purpose of what we're trying to achieve, which is a, a school where every student knows every adult, and every adult knows every student. You won't get that once you get past 400 students. You just don't. And so our goal is to ensure. Uh, that in regards to the size of the building um, and how we're going to pay for that well certainly um, charter schools are required to pay for buildings through ADA unlike traditional school districts who use uh, eminent domain and so it will be dollars from the kids because ADA is required for leases or mortgages uh, but beyond that uh, PCI will be loaning and also grants that we will receive in order to start the school okay all right um, you mentioned that there's going to be lots of growth and that'll offset it and so that we don't have to worry about closures or schools. Have you realized we're going into a recession, interest rates are gonna go up, builders are closing down, things are slowing down, things are going the other way. So with that said, which is gonna happen, because I'm in that industry, we are, you're gonna open up in the next two or three years, we're gonna be in a recession, there will be no growth, and then so where are those students gonna come from? Yeah, so, I think that's the beautiful thing about the, uh, the charter school law, which is if families don't want the school, the school will not exist. And so you've answered your own question, which is we won't exist if we aren't attractive to parents and their students. And if we are, then you guys are right for approving us and we are right to try to offer an alternative school choice for families. Or would it come from the local schools like uh, White Rock and Cordova Villa, all those schools in that area would be go to that school and then would you think that maybe school closures will happen? $3.7 million lost for fiscal last year or greater might have us happen? I think the charter the school law was clear, which is uh, charter schools are competition for the traditional system. That's one of the elements of the law. And I, I believe that us being present would actually improve the schools because of the shared common goal of improving, improving services and opportunities for students. So you think competition uh, siphoning out from the existing schools there, kids of English language learners and have a lot of special support is going to enhance our already great programs that we have? So I, I, uh, I, I think that uh, the most important uh, customer here is a student and their parent. And so that's what we should be contending with, not whether it's a charter school or a, a traditional school. Okay. Lastly, um, the only other thing that I, I would ask is, is that we are deficient. Would you still be amiable to correct those deficiencies 
not in the MOU basis, but coming back and correcting those uh, bases by repetitioning because uh, uh, it just seems like that's a better process to go. Would you be amenable to that? Uh, I am. I'm looking forward to a decision tonight from the board. Oh, I see. Okay, that's all I got. Thank you. Let's see, um, board member Clark. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, hi, Paul. Hi, Chris. How are you? I'm very good. Good, good. So, yeah, I've got a lot of scratch outs because <laughs> Mr. Huey asked some questions, and of course, uh, um, Ed asked a few questions that I was going to ask, but I. Um, I'm concerned about that area along Mather Field and, you know, the traffic. And if you're going to target kids in that Cordova Villa area, I'm assuming that they'll have to walk to get there as they walk to their school because uh, parents may not have the transportation knowing that you don't provide transportation, right? We don't. Okay. Transportation. So I'm, I'm just concerned about those kids crossing Mather Field at 8, 815, and sometimes I do go that way. Just, you know, if I'm visiting a school in that area early, I go down Mather Field. And that traffic is horrendous. It is. And I don't, I don't see how cars can get in and out in a, in a good time to drop their kids off or pick their kids up, especially during that time when that traffic is really, really bad, especially with businesses and state workers on the other side of uh, Old Placerville that take Rockingham, I'm sorry, that take Rockingham um, to get onto Matherfield, that traffic is horrendous. And it starts usually around 2.45, 3 o'clock. So how do you propose those kids who are walking get across Matherfield? Yeah, so we would, uh, safety is number one priority. And working with the city, we would ensure every student has a safe, thoroughfare to get to to get to uh, school and so that being said um, as we mentioned we have a facility that we like and we will pursue every every avenue that the board would be concerned with in regards to the safety of the students but the city also knows that uh, students walk on those streets whether they're school or not and so they too have vested interest in making sure the school the, the streets are safe how, how is that going to happen though I mean are they going to build like a a bridge to you know kids can walk over I mean and I'm being facetious here but so are they gonna have a traffic monitor I mean how is that gonna work I mean think about it those kids coming from across uh, Rockingham uh, over off of Laurelhurst I'm familiar with that area and maybe those kids that live in the apartment that can walk around the corner how are they gonna get across that street safely and those cars do speed. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, but yeah, they so do I, fly up and down that thoroughfare. I certainly don't have an answer tonight, but student safety is 100% uh, top of mind. Okay. I, I, I get the student safety. Um, you said that the charter school in Roseville is successful. Um, didn't it just start like a few weeks ago? It did start uh, At August, the date of the support, August how 8th. successful it is. Well, I think the very fact that we got a school started, approved in February, got the keys in July 1st, mm -hmm. did all the, re the TIs, and we had, key we had students in school on the 8th, okay. is, uh, is, a, is a success. All right. Um, and one thing that's near and dear to my heart, and I think everybody knows this, is the supports for special education are disabled students. What supports do you have in place for them? Uh, how qualified are your teachers? Because we talk about credentialing and, and all that sure. good stuff. So it's an amazing thing. New Pacific School right now <coughs> is, I believe, 14 to 15 percent special ed. That, those are the families that are attracted to our school. And we believe that it might actually creep up to about 20 percent because we're identifying students whose parents have had struggles with their students in the traditional public system. And we are using our in-house Pacific Charter Institute staff who is credentialed in all, or we contract out for OT or speech or our own ESs. So uh, it is 100% credentialed and uh, the very best staff to serve as students. So you will be contracting out is what I'm hearing. For well, certainly, because small schools, support. you don't want to own a whole employee if you don't have to. 
because it's too expensive. Okay, but it's what's best for the student, though, right? So, yeah, you're doing I mean, what's best, I, which I is you always want to make sure you balance every your every dime I could possibly get to ensure that our kids are being educated, especially our special need kids. Oh, but. you're 100% right, Mr. Clark, and I'm sure that uh, uh, Folsom Cordova con contracts out as well for special education services. Okay. So it's not an unknown practice. All right. All right. So um, the video that you had, I loved it. Thank you. Um the one thing I didn't see in there, and I'm going to go back to our special needs, I didn't see any of our special needs students in that video. I mean, ones that are maybe bound by a wheelchair or anything like that. I mean, you said that you do have a percentage of those there, right? Sure. And as you know, uh, special education students, their, their um, disabilities could be cognitive, they could be physical, they could be any number of things. And so, as I mentioned, uh, we have, I believe, 14% special education, and we're doing child find to make sure that we capture every single student's needs so that we're able to service them. What we're finding is the better we do with early, early uh, literacy, the more we can help students not even need to qualify for special education because of the work we do. But our goal is to make sure we find the students and give them the absolute best services. All right. A um, couple more questions. Um, Well, this is a what if, and I'm kind of famous for asking what ifs. What if this facility doesn't work out? You can't make the improvements to, you know, the traffic is bad and the charter is already approved. Will you be utilizing Prop 39 to look at our facilities, our district campuses? Absolutely not. We will not use Prop 39, but we would be willing to rent facilities from the district. Is that I believe that is part of your, um, it is in your petition, correct, Prop 39? I don't. You don't think? I don't I, think I'm so. I'm not sure it is either, but I, I could have swore I saw it. Maybe I had you confused with the... Well, it's open. I mean, but I, I don't see us, uh, if it's in there, uh, I'd be willing to strike that tonight. Um, but, because uh, that's not my interest. But we would be willing to rent facilities from the district uh, if the facility works for our, our organization. Okay. And we do that in Twin Rivers. We've been doing that for years. Okay. And then you will have um, the ADA requirements in place at that new facility on Rockingham, correct? For You'll sure. You'll go through and, and have all that done? Yes. And you're proposing to start this next September? August. August. Okay. With fully credentialed staff and... Everything. Okay. I'm just kind of curious on how you're going to recruit those staff, um, being that there is a teacher shortage. And I know us as a district is having a hard time recruiting staff. So um, that'd be something to see. Um, that's all I have right now, Mr. President. All right. Thank you. Uh, Board Member Hoover. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, so, Mr. Kiefer, uh, Dr. Kiefer, sorry, I demoted you. Uh, That's all right. I, um, it fits me better. <laughs> uh, so, you know, it seems like this Roseville school, you know, you moved mountains a little bit to get it going. So it seems like, uh, I guess, what is your prognosis for uh, the likelihood that, as Mr. Clark pointed out, you know, you would have the time to recruit um, given that this would be a little bit longer time period than you had uh, in, in the uh, Roseville model? So the Roseville school was approved in February, and so uh, we're in September right now. So that would provide us almost a year. Yeah. It would provide us 11 months to, to keys in hand. Uh, our goal would be that we would hire the, the staff uh, earlier so that they could uh, do uh, some immersion with the, uh, the, the current Roseville School and, and work with them and pair up with them to see how they do what they do and, and so that we hit the ground running even better. And um, so that's one piece. As far as facilities, uh, we have a great contractor and we have a, a, a top-notch real estate team that's helping us. And so we believe that uh, they, will, they will move mountains for us. And you talked a little bit about the city. Uh, what, how, how did your conversations with the city go in terms of you know, finding a location and everything? I learned a lot because they cover things I have no idea what they're talking about, uh, where water's going and how water moves. And uh, so it was very interesting, but they, they were very comfortable with the conversation and they were comfortable with, with uh, Rockingham. But I, I duly noted yep. what uh, 
uh, Mr. Clark has talked about, and I know that um, comfort for everybody is very important. I guess I'd have to say that um, to have so many students enroll in our school and we didn't have a building goes to show you that this model has a, um, a real interest for families <clears throat> that aren't looking for a traditional school. And I think um, that's pretty weird, right? They, they drive by the school and they're wondering, is anything gonna happen to this place? And all of a sudden there's a school and there's grass and there's images. Yep. And so um, now we would ha have a long layup and it would be a, a great thing for the kids to see, you know, the families to be able to engage with it. So uh, last time, <clears throat> last time we had a discussion on on this proposal, um, you know, you were kind of criticized for not having a classroom based school yet. This time, it's kind of exciting because you've opened one. So so what has uh, the experience been so far? And what have some of the teachers and staff kind of talked to you about, you know, about how it's going with project based learning in the program? It's really hard. It's uh, because teachers used to a traditional classroom having to, and, and, and Mr. Garb would, it will do a much better job explaining it, but watching um, <clears throat> teachers be able to have students figure out that there are no limits to the work they can do and having a paraprofessional be able to work with that teacher and, and develop uh, plans for the students. It's, um, it's a very warm environment and the students knowing they're always, they're always being trained in Leader and Me principles, which is a Franklin Covey, uh, that they're really, in a month's time, we've seen their behavior really, they really are understanding their place in the school and, and really how much they own the school. The more, they, the more they've developed the skill sets to be um, responsible citizens. Do you have any data on that school and the uh, kids per class at this point? Do you know that number? Or? So we have 72 total students and uh, K through and five. TK5, TK5. And our, our smallest class right now is our four or five. I think it's, I'm gonna say 11 or 12 students. And so, um, it's and what's a your place, largest class? It's our, it's our K1, and I believe it's at like 26 or okay. 20. We're getting a lot of interest at that grade level. Excellent. Grade level. Um, I'll probably have some more later, but that's it for now. Thank you. Dr. Sure. Cooper. Let's see. Uh, Board member Shivato, I'm, I'm working on your. Oh, she's not. She stepped out. She stepped out. Uh, I have to get that last name. Shivato. Um, uh, board member Prez, do you have any questions? Yes, I would just like to ask: How do you compare the workload and pay of a charter school teacher with that of a public school teacher? So, every school district has a um, has a different uh, contract with their employees, and so. Um, and every charter school has a different agreement with their employees. And so uh, what, we've, what we try to do is put ourselves somewhere in the middle because we can't pay the most, but we find that our health benefits are some of the highest in the region. And so we actually lose candidates sometimes because maybe our salary isn't as high as it could be, but our health benefits for the, for the employee is 100%. And for the family, I believe it's 65 or 70%. And so, uh, and that's Anthem, Kaiser, uh, and so we, we, we really try to take care of our teachers and make sure they have, they have the, uh, and our staff. But I would say our, our salary schedules, as I mentioned before, we've been adding to it uh, over the last three years. And so um, we have a high retention rate. We, we have an 88% all staff retention rate. And, uh, and people are uh, eager to be hired by us. And so I think people walking with their feet dictates how the pay works to the job they're gonna be doing. Thank you. Board member Shrivato. Yeah, um, so one of my questions was, um, I just wanna confirm that the board of directors is self-appointed, that's correct? Our board of directors are, uh, are voted on by the board members that are on the board. Okay, got it. Um, so have any steps been taken to affirm that those directors are diverse, um, especially considering that that governing body will be responsible for expulsions which disproportionately impact students of color? Sure, we've never had an expulsion at Pacific Charter Institute, and we've been around for 17 years, and right now we have 3,100 students, so we've never had an expulsion. Uh, and I believe we haven't had a suspension either. Uh, but to the extent of diversity, is there a particular diversity that you're calling out? Yeah, I was wondering specifically about racial diversity. So is there a particular racial diversity you're looking for? No, just any makeup. Okay, so uh, our, our board currently, uh, we have two African-American uh, gentlemen, Jean-Paul Prentice is one of them. Uh, we have a, a Latina, yeah, Miss Martha. Uh, we have uh, Alpana, who is uh, Eastern Indian. 
Um, and there's seven board members. And then we have a Caucasian female, Caucasian male, probably missing some, two Caucasian males. So that's our diversity. Okay, thank you. And is we there, could always do better, but that's where we are. Okay. <laughs> um, and is there a consideration to have a student representative on that board by any chance? It hasn't come up. Okay. Okay. Um, and then I'm not sure if this would be directed at you, Dr. Kiefer, um, but would the charter be included in uh, Folsom Cordova's emergency safety protocols that we've developed with the city? You know, I would welcome that if that was an opportunity. I know in Roseville, they've started incorporating their schools into their, their camera systems. And so uh, that would be exciting and useful. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, um, I just have a, a couple questions. Uh, first, uh, uh, what is the racial ethnic balance at your Roseville site? Uh, I guess the Roseville site in my mind is the best one to compare because it's in person yes. and you're looking at an in-person facility here as well. Yeah, so currently it's uh, 60, I want to say about 60% Caucasian and then 20% um, African American and and then and then 12% kind of rounding out um, other nationalities. Okay. Racially. Yeah. And uh, what um, percentage, if you know, uh, would you say is a socially economic uh, challenge since that's one of the issues that's come up, uh, um, the social economic uh, diversity within sure. the school? Did you give that, that total number as they're filling out their paperwork for the school, but it's around 60%. About 60%? So about 60% is, and we're, we're spitballing a little bit, but we believe it's about that number. I don't have the hard number for you. Okay, no, that's fine, thank you. Uh, let's see. Um, no, I th believe, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, the comparisons that were in the staff report were all to your um, distance learning sites, correct? Yes, and if we're talking about CASP sc scores, it was 2019 and it was our, our independent study and homeschooling programs. And your target population for your um, homeschool independent study uh, schools is different than your tar target population for your Roseville school? Absolutely, because uh, not every family wants to homeschool their child or, or have their child independent study. And so we're looking for families who want their child in a five day a week program with before and after school care available to them. Do you have uh, parents from Rancho Cordova or Folsom traveling to your, your school? We do. Uh, from both communities or one? Both community? communities. Both communities. Um, uh, I, all right, this is probably an odd question or a couple of questions, but uh, first of all, um, have you entered into MOUs with uh, other school districts? Yes, we have five MOUs with five different school districts. Okay, uh, does New Pacific consider an MOU a contractual obligation? Yes. So uh, you would feel that a violation of the MOU would have um, re, um, legal recourse from the other, part, excuse me, the other contracting party. Sure, I think it, it lays it out. You know how that would be, uh, how that would be adjudicated, and certainly uh, cures that would need to be put in place based on charter school law. Okay, and you would be open to an MOU with our uh, with our um, school district. Absolutely. Well. Okay. All right. Uh, question for the superintendent or staff. Um, I know uh, I'm trying to look at this map and it doesn't have the streets on it, but it appears, and I could be wrong, that the very intersection that board member Clark was referring to where students would have to cross the street, um, our Cordova Villa Elementary School boundaries requires the students to cross the same streets. Is that correct? No. It's not? Yes. Mm. Looks like it. Right, right there's the intersection. That's the police station. And there's international. We have the map we can bring up. Well, uh, anyway, I could be yeah. misreading the map, but it sure does look like. I, I think they would. They're if they're crossing. on the other side of they're like Mather Field, if that's where they were living, that they, they would. They would be um, crossing that, that yeah. busy they street. Would, yeah. Yes. Yeah, to yes. get to that school, yes. Yeah. But, but our students that are attending Cordova Villa Elementary School would be crossing that same street to get to Cordova Villa Elementary School. 
According to the map, I'm, I'm looking no. at. Perhaps, but I'm also wondering if that at that distance, do those students then qualify for a bus? Well, on the other or side Villa. of Rockingham, going across Old Placerville is actually Sac City. Mm -hmm. That is not Rancho Cordova. That's not Folsom Cordova. That is That's Sac City. Then I'm really bad at looking at maps because that certainly looks like Cordova Villa. Anyway, um, <laughs> perhaps a question for another time. Well, their location would need to be within the district boundaries. New Pacific Charter School's location. Oh, correct. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I'm, I'm, looking at the, I'm looking at the boundaries of Cordova Villa Elementary School, the attendance boundaries for Cordova Villa Elementary School. And it sure does look like the, the attendance boundaries of Cordova Villa Elementary School is crossing the very streets that we're having concerns with. I think we have, obviously we don't, we're not sure we have to confirm that, yeah. but it, but that would be for that area, that would be the closest elementary school. Right. Right. Okay. All right. Um, I, I guess my point is if, if our students are crossing the same streets, um, I, I don't think we can hold but the applicant to a, yeah, but they're a, not. That Sac City. No, I, side. Sac City is over here. No, I'm willing to take it. No, that's how we. Okay. Right there. I'll take you for a drive tomorrow. If okay. you're <laughs> All right. Um, so, All right, uh, I think that's the questions I have for right this uh, minute. So why don't we get to uh, public comment. And uh, let's see, we will start with uh, uh, Joanne Perez, did you want to speak? Okay, yes, I've changed my mind. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> You're allowed to do that. Hello, my name is Joanne Perez. I'm here as a grandparent. <laughs> And I'd like to just correct the boundaries. In 2000, unless Rancho Cordova school boundaries have changed, I had to get a transfer for my daughter to attend Cordova High School. So that area is not Rancho Cordova boundaries. And I'd like to mention that there's a hotel called the Days Inn on that corner. Not a good place to be. Just saying. People coming in and out, right? There's a Days Inn right there on the corner. Anywho. Hi, I, I won't mention the, what goes on I, I there, but not good. Rancho PD's there constantly. I grew up in the neighborhood, across Rockingham and Abbott Ford. Um, since that hotel came in, nothing good has come. It's changed its name, I don't know how many times. But I'm here to say, after the staff report, I, I would like to ask you, as a grandparent, I have grandchildren in Folsom, Cordova. Vote no, please, please, thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker will be uh, Angela Bickelman. Hi, I'm Angela Bickelman. Um, I now work for a new Pacific school. I'm a parent and a teacher, and I've taught at project-based learning schools for 15 years. Um, so that's what I'm looking for for my child and to be honest with you, the place that I want to teach too. Um, I joined the school because I read their charter and I was so excited about what they were doing and as I've worked with the people on this team, I've gotten more and more excited about what they're doing in Roseville and what they plan to do here in my neighborhood. So. Um, I joined the outreach team and I've talked to over a hundred different parents in the area at different events, um, the parents who've signed up to our list that they're interested um, and having conversations. And I wanted to share some of their learning, um, their ch children's learning and experiences and their reasons for supporting New Pacific School. Uh, while flyering in Rancho near Rockingham Drive, I met a mom who recently started homeschooling. Her son was diagnosed with high functioning autism and was struggling to follow the whole class group plan. He needed more small group instruction and a chance to make choices about what he's learning about in school. He needs a more supportive social emotional environment because he's experiencing daily meltdowns in his classroom. Homeschooling isn't sustainable for her long term, so she's desperately exploring other options. 
At Party in the Park, we met several families who, who were eager to sign their children up for New Pacific School. One mom talked about her rambunctious kindergartner was coming home from school crying every day because he kept getting in trouble because he couldn't sit still or sit for instruction on the carpet for as many hours as he was expected to in class. He needs a space where he can move and she's exploring educational alternatives. One family talked about their drive to the closest middle school will be close to 30 minutes in the morning, each way with traffic, so two hours of driving. And at an event I ignored, organized at White Rock Park, um, another family talked about how excited they were about this school. One mom said, and I quote, New Pacific looks really aligned with our dream education for our kiddos. My children learn so fast by doing projects, but retain very little when doing uh, worksheets or flashcards. Project-based learning sounds phenomenal and is exactly what my son needs. Her son starts kindergarten next year, like mine, um, and we are really hoping that New Pacific School is an option for our families. Um, I've heard from families that they want what New Pacific School has to offer, and I have lots more anecdotes that I don't have time for. So, thank, thank you. you. Uh, next speaker is uh, Candace Kruger. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Candace Kruger. I am a member of the Rancho Cordova community and a parent of a student in the district. We already have a fantastic charter school. In fact, my child is enrolled in Folsom Cordova Community Charter, which is a K through eight charter with a campus located south of Highway 50. I urge you to vote no on the Pacific Charter Institute because I don't want a subpar charter school in my community. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker is Eric Garber. Greeting, President Reed and Board. Hi, my name is Eric Garber. I'm the principal at uh, Roseville uh, New Pacific School. And so I just want to open by just introducing myself and what drew me um, to, the, to the charter school. Um, so I've been in education for 20, 22 years now and uh, in administration for the last seven. Uh, and looking at what they were combining was really what drew me there. I'm also a doctoral student, finished my dissertation on educational systems and what works in learning for students. And that's what's excited me about, about creating something a little bit different. If you look through the charter, a couple things won't come out on a piece of paper I wanted to bring up. Um, one is the number of innovations that are on there all by themselves are, are things that are in other schools. But combining those in the way that we're doing right now is something that is unique. Um, and I'm seeing those unique combinations play out on a daily basis. Um, some of those you've already brought up. Um, but ultimately, all of them add up to a school that we're trying to build that fits to the kid. And so as opposed to trying to get a kid to fit to the school, we're doing the opposite. And that's what we're doing on a daily basis. The teachers that we found that apply for this job uh, were teachers that read the charter were also equally excited about this opportunity to do something that's just a little bit different. And I've already told them before the stuff we're combining, the things we're doing, and the way we're um, really empathetically listening to the children and the families and building a school around their child um, is something that is unique enough that that's going to be what I write about next after I finish my current research on looking at all these different school systems and what they're trying to do um, to increase student achievement across the board for all students. Um, and um, something I can specifically say that um, I wanted to bring up that doesn't show up on the charter petition is the, the real thing that matters. I can tell you about all kinds of details, but really it's going to be how those students and the parents talk about the school and what they think about the school. And so one particular parent, I asked her permission to share this, um, she was, um, she's a foster parent. She's a, a foster parent uh, for 37 different children um, at different points for the last few decades. She's been through 34 different school districts and school sites in her time with her kids. She said for her children, this is the first child that it's, first school has ever gotten it right. Um, it's made a world of difference for her child, um, just like many of our other special education students. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker is Rob Thomas. Thank you. Um, so the first site um, that uh, they were looking at was in an industrial area, um, which was obviously unsuitable. The second site, um, the people who live in Rancho Cordova and know Rancho Cordova are telling us is unsafe for the students. Um, we're already talking about an MOU 
So obviously we have concerns about the petition. Um, our staff report and our educators are telling us they have no secret sauce. Um, there's nothing special they offer. Your administrators are asking you to deny. Your educators are asking you to deny. Your classified staff is asking you to deny. Largely, the rancho community uh, is, is not encouraging you to, to, su to support this. Um, New Pacific School will not provide our students with anything better than we are already providing them. Give us the opportunity to serve our students. Bottom line, show your faith in your current team, FCUSD. Thank you. Thank you. Let's see, uh, Lupe Hernandez, uh, you had this uh, additionally? Yeah. Okay. Sure do. Okay. Thank you. It'd be really helpful if you had a floating microphone because some of us really can't do these steps. First of all, what I'd like to remind some folks is that I lived 20 years in the White Rock area. I know what White Rock comprises of. Low income, gangs, drugs, prostitutes, even over at Villa in that particular area. Our schools, our schools in that particular area are represented by board members that truly represent us. The, the current situation with the safety, it's not, really, it's not really safe if you don't look at the bigger picture. I just looked at the charter school you have in Roseville. It's in Clinton Avenue in a residential area. It's not in a business area, okay? I know exactly where it's at. I was born and raised in Roseville, so you can't hoodwink me, okay? I'm here to tell you that I represent parents, students, and guardians in Ranch Cordova. I'd like to inform you that the public education, Folsom Cordova Unified School District has not educated and informed the parents of the schools that are gonna be impacted if these charter schools were to come into play. I know those areas. I lived in the White Rock area 20 years. I have families and friends that live in the Villa area. I know Rockingham, I know Mather. Those are not safe areas. And if Ranch Cordova Police Department can't even take care of our kids trying to cross the street, how are they gonna help our kids at a new charter school? Let me tell you, a Mills middle school student was hit this morning on their way to school. Do any of you know about that? No, let me, let me express to you that the areas you're targeting are high income, low income people, majority people of color, high immigrant population, newcomers coming from various countries, just immigrating into our country as asylum, asylum seekers because of the wars going on in, in the Ukraine. I have not been educated the parents I know have not been educated. We don't know what a charter school, this is the first time I ever heard about a charter school. I'm not informed, I've had to Google this. Can you imagine a parent that does not know the language, how are they gonna learn about this? No on this people, because it's not gonna happen in Rancho, it's not for us. We don't want it in Rancho, it's not gonna happen because you don't represent us. Who represents us in Rancho? I know who does and who doesn't. No, thank you, not Rancho. Thank you. Thank you. And we have uh, Dominic uh, Gudis. Falco. 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 Okay. Uh, hello, good evening. I'm Dominic Walk. I'm the labor up with CSCA. I'm going to touch on a few things. Um, first, I think it's 
I would just caution the board from using data for, from a school that's been open for three weeks. I don't think that would pass the muster of reliable data anywhere, and it should not be when you're making a decision about students' education and taxpayer dollars. Second, I want to again touch on that several weeks ago, a group of Sacramento County residents asked the Attorney General to approve to file a lawsuit enforcing the opinion of Attorney General Opinion Number 20-102 which asserted that the petitioner tonight, Mr. Kiefer, holds two incompatible positions, one as a SCOE board of trustee member and the other as a PCI executive. Uh, the existing AG opinion in the proposed lawsuit called into the question the appropriateness of the governance structure in the charter petition tonight, and that alone could be reason to deny. Last time we were here, uh, the response was something along the lines of, quote, uh, an attorney's general opinion is just that. It's an opinion, unquote. I don't think we should be taking a response like that seriously. Uh, this, that's a big issue. Um, second, again, uh, it cautions me when I hear of a school, uh, several schools that have been open for almost 20 years with not a single suspension or expulsion. Uh, it calls into question what students are being enrolled uh, and the response to issues with those students. Um, <clears throat> again, I want to encourage you to deny the petition as has been stated tonight. Um, economic indicators are that growth south of 50 is gonna slow down. You already ignored those economic indicators when you approved design tech. Please don't do it again. I think we also need to touch on the fact that the Sacramento County Office of Education superintendent is appointed by the board. He is not elected by voters. Um, so that calls again, I think, in, to the appropriateness of a Sacramento County Office of Education management employee voting on a petition put forward um, by Mr. Kiefer. I think that's a big concern. Uh, the response last time was that Mr. Kiefer is not Mr. Huey's boss, uh, but who is the boss of your boss. Ultimately, it's the superintendent who's appointed by Mr. Kiefer. That is a big concern that I think people should pay attention to. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's go to online. Do we have anybody who would like to speak? Yes, several. First is Debbie. Okay, welcome, Debbie. Hi, Debbie Krikorian, FCUSD teacher. Good evening, Dr. Cleegan, President Reed, and fellow trustees. First, this petition has been filed with California Attorney General stating Dr. Kiefer is in violation of government code section 1099 and education code 1006 due to his conflict of interest created by holding two incompatible offices, that of executive director of a charter school operating in Sacramento County and his position on the Sacramento County Board of Education. As Dominic stated, this is reason for denial alone. The AG has already stated that this structure is illegal because they are incompatible offices. In addition, the new charter had the same principal signature on the FCUSD application as the Yuba City School application. How could a principal reside over two schools in two districts? Three teachers signed both petitions too. Two of the three teachers are employees under, of Heritage under Dr. Kiefer this is inappropriate for him to ask his employees to sign a petition. Second, I must ask a question of Mr. Huey. As an employee of Sacramento County of Office of Education who works under the SCOE School Board, if so, if you are an employee there, you too have a conflict of interest in deciding on the matter of opening up a charter school led by Dr. Kiefer. Other board members have recused themselves for being affiliated with outside sources, such as a grant FCUSD applied for or contracts offered by a company a board member worked for, among others. You should do the same. At the very least, this is because it's the ethical thing to do, Mr. Huey. Finally, and most important, Dr. Kiefer's schools do not meet the needs of Rancho Cordova students. Of his independent study schools, Rancho Cordova schools outperform Pacific charter schools. State adopted materials are not used. Thank you. Next we have Jennifer. Jennifer, welcome. Hello, I am speaking as a parent tonight um, of a Mitchell's middle school student and a Cordova High student. 
You have already approved a charter school that is currently under scrutiny for suspension and possible expulsion of three, 13 students who participated in a lunchtime protest of a new cell phone policy. Why would we need another charter school in the exact same neighborhood targeting the exact same students? The only difference is this one is a K-12 while the other is a 9-12. If you truly want this charter to be within FCUSD borders, which our district has already said you should deny, then why not have them find a place in Folsom? A previous parent said not to think of student as dollars, but if those dollars go away, then what happens to the schools that everyone else goes to? Please vote no on this charter and design tech. And I would like to give the rest of my time back to Debbie. I'm not sure how we measure the rest of the time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we have one minute left. One minute. All right. Uh, uh, Debbie, did you want to uh, wrap up with the final minute? Is she back on? Yes, I would. Thank you. Yeah. The proposed school is not offering something better for Rancho Cordova. We have all the programs of Rancho Cordova, Cordova schools as stated by the staff. But you would know this if you visit the Rancho Cordova schools. If Rancho Cordova parents truly wanted the program, the room would be filled with parents advocating for the school, not a few scattered individuals. Wait and watch the brick and mortar school in Roseville and view the gather data gathered over this next year to determine the school's success or failure. Are you willing to trust our students to a school run by someone who appears to use his position to further his own interests? I'm hearing talk of an MOU again. MOUs are not enforceable with no case law put into place. Our districts cannot afford legal fees to create case law. It takes money from our students' education. FCUSD students deserve better. Local control overseen by ethical Folsom Cordova Unified School District Board Trustees. Vote to deny the petition. Thank you. Patrice, welcome. Patrice, are you there? I'm here. There you are. We hear you. So I have, I just have a bunch of questions. Um, what school was that video depicting? Because it, sh it should have been Roseville, but it didn't say Roseville. Sir? You can ask the questions, but we can't uh, engage in, in back and forth dialogue. OK, I'm, but it's for that the guy who did the presentation. Not right. Sports. Right. Well, we we, we can't uh, allow for that back and forth dialogue. Okay. But you, but so okay, I got questions. a couple. I got a couple more questions. Sure. Who pays that guy's salary? Why are they trying to force a charter school into a community that one they cannot support, and two, they don't want them. Three, they can't even meet what we already. They can't even beat what's already out there. They coming in mediocrity. They are fixing what what issues they're being presented with instead of coming in on their A game. We don't need them. Say no. Just say no. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Jeanette. Jeanette, welcome. <clears throat> Good evening, gentlemen. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So dear board, my name is Jeanette Sansenbach and I'm here speaking as a citizen at Folsom, at Folsom living in the Lexington Hills area. The FUSD district administration has spoken and the, uh, the Rancho Cordova board members have spoken. The citizens of Rancho Cordova have spoken. None of these individuals have spoken well of this particular charter school slated for Rancho Cordova. What, what I don't understand is why you Folsom board members think you know better for a city that you never have lived in and you don't represent the citizens of Rancho Cordova. If you feel the school is so wonderful, suggest that you start the charter school be housed in Folsom. I believe that the board members living in this in Rancho Cordova should be deciding on this issue. Mr. Reed, you are trying to be reelected this year. I live in your district. Once you had my support and I rallied for you because I believe you would listen to your fellow board members, teachers and district personnel. You have displayed this characteristic as no longer true. I will not be voting for you or rallying my peers, <clears throat> friends and family. I hope that this decision and in the future you will listen and I can be your voice again. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Jennifer, welcome. Jennifer, are you there? Sorry, I usually go by Jen, so uh, 
Yeah, my name is Jen Jones. Um, I teach at Carl Sendall. I actually am not a resident of California, uh, but I encourage you to go ahead and listen to our Rancho Cordova board members. Um, we don't need a charter school in Rancho Cordova. We sure as heck don't need one in Folsom as well. I'd ask you that you vote no on this charter school and let our Rancho Cordova board members and the community itself be the ones to make this decision. Thank you. Thank you. Stacy, welcome. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, Mr. Clark, yes, please take him for a drive. Actually take all of the Folsom board members for a drive so they can see what Rancho Cordova looks like, not just City Hall. Thank you. Um, it sounds to me that the Folsom Region board members, along with this stranger, are more enamored with the idea of gentrifying Rancho Cordova instead of listening to the FCUSD, FCUSD staff on the seemingly long list of red flags. The charter has not done a traffic survey. It has no transportations for its students, which shows me that in the rush to get this charter approved so that their brick and mortar dollars and grants can continue to roll in, has Dr. Keep time at all in Rancho Cordova? And I'm talking 95670, Rancho Cordova, not Gold River, not 95742. Um, Roseville is not Rancho. To quote Regina George, stop trying to make fetch happen. President Reed, board members, please, who do you trust? The FCUSD staff or this stranger? Where do your loyalties lie? Please listen to the FCUSD staff presentation. Rancho schools depend on it. Vote no on this charter. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have a, a, a person uh, in the audience as well who wants to speak, uh, Trinika Brown. Thank you for letting me say a couple words. Um, so I hear a lot of politics being spoken about tonight. I'm more interested in the children and the families um, in the community that are not really being served as much as we need by the current system. So there's some things that I'm interested in that New Pacific School offers that the current school my children attend do not offer, such as um, an extended school day for kindergartners, my um, grandkids who I'm raising by myself and want the best for, they don't have access to that. Um, New Pacific School offers arts and language classes in all grade levels. Um, New Pacific School offers um, free of charge um, care for children from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m school my grandkids attend certainly doesn't offer that um, and then I'm hearing about this leader in me I want my grandkids to be leaders so I don't know if the public schools offer that but um, that's something that I would want my children to um, have access to and the project-based learning and the social economic um, social emotional um, learning uh, Education shouldn't be one size fits all. Not all children are the same. There's different learning styles. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Jen. Jen, welcome. Hello, can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Um, good evening, Dr. Kaligian, Mr. Reed and board members. I was not going to speak tonight as a new charter school would not directly affect me or my children. However, there are a few things that have made my spidey senses turn on tonight. First, you finally have voices from Rancho Cordova speaking up. This does not happen very often. While there are a few, Ms. Hernandez and others tonight and last month are speaking up for parents who typically do not feel comfortable enough to speak up, whether due to language barriers or even fear of retaliation. You will notice that there are not many parents from Folsom speaking up tonight because they know that this does not directly apply to their students. Please listen to these families who are taking the time out of their personal days to speak up. Just because there is not a huge turnout tonight does not mean that the families of our district do not care. Listen to Mr. Clark and Mr. Short. They get it. Furthermore, 
I'm very intrigued how a school has found the magic potion for eliminating special ed. Tonight, Dr. Kiefer said, and I quote, our early literacy instruction will help students not qualify for special ed. What evidence does he have that early literacy instruction will help students to not qualify for special education? Please vote no on this charter school tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Screen name NW. Hello, this is Nancy White. I'm a teacher at Cordova High School. Um, I also hadn't planned to speak tonight, but I was listening and took a few quick notes and I just wanted to make sure that I uh, represented the community that I, I do serve um, and some of the teachers at my school who work very hard in their academies to provide a good education for all of our students. Uh, first, I want to say that for all the research that New Pacific claims to have done, they, they've demonstrated tonight that they don't really know the community of Rancho Cordova. It's clear by the choices of the locations that they've proposed. The community members and their local representatives have spoken loud and clear. They told you that their constituents, the community has told you that they do not want this charter. Please have faith in our staff. Please support our teachers and our programs, the programs that just a few weeks ago you applauded. Now you are basically undermining all of that work by even considering this charter. Um, there was one more thing that I wanted to say about um, the community. Um, our schools serve every student that shows up, not just the students that will look good on paper uh, to um, give great statistics for um, um, proposing an, um, more charters. Please vote to deny Pacific Charter. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry, Ricardo. Ricardo, sorry. Ricardo. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Ricardo Soto. I'm the um, Chief Advocacy Officer and General Counsel at the California Char School Association. Uh, the California Char School Association represents over 700 char schools across the state of California and works directly with our members in supporting them with respect to their petitions um, and also their renewals that come before school boards, including the Pacific Char School Institute. Um, I wanted to address two points that have been made um, earlier um, concerning uh, but whether or not um, the board should be uh, um, voting against this petition simply because um, Dr. Kiefer serves on the Sacramento County Board of Education. Um, as has been stated before, there has been a petition that was filed by both the California School Employees Association and the California Teachers Association uh, seeking approval from the Attorney General uh, to um, institute a lawsuit against uh, uh, Mr. Kiefer for the purposes of trying to remove him. That is not a basis to deny this petition. In fact, that um, request and that lawsuit has nothing to do with the petition that is before the board this evening. Uh, that's completely separate and apart from what you should be considering in determining whether or not to approve this petition. Of course, we I encourage you to approve the petition because we believe that it meets the legal requirements for approval and charters uh, boards and districts are encouraged to approve charters. Secondly, uh, there's been mention about one of the board members on your board being a, a Sacramento County Office of Education employee recusing themselves. And uh, lawyers in California that serve uh, educational agencies understand that county offices of education are different than school districts. The employees of county offices of education are employees that are um, subject to control by the county superintendent and not by the county board. There's no conflict of interest for your board member to vote on this matter. And uh, here he should participate in that in this vote. We encourage you to approve this petition. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next. Next we have Julian. Julian, welcome. <clears throat> Julian, are you there? I'm sorry, yet yeah, Marquez, it's actually Celeste Marquez. I'm, I'm under my son's login. I don't know how to use a computer. No, <laughs> sorry. Not a problem. Um, so, so I actually am a parent that lives in Rancho Cordova and I have lived here for 10 years and Julian attends New Pacific School in Roseville. 
And I cannot tell you how amazing it is. We know everybody by name and everybody knows every student by name. He has, there are up to 25 students in his class and it's continued to grow because we see that our, our children are thriving there. And it's just been a couple weeks, but they're happy to go to school. They're happy to learn. They're excited. Everything is amazing there. I am so grateful for the school. And I have, uh, I, I submitted a letter to the board to let them know that I am um, in support for New Pacific to be in Rancho Cordova. We, had, we have a son that's 22 years old and down to three years old. So we have three kids. I've never once considered a school in Rancho Cordova because of safety and bullying. And I'm willing to drive 40 minutes, five days a week, just one way to, to drop him off at school and know that he's okay. He's completely safe. And I know there's a lot of concerns. I don't know that area of Rancho Cordova because I don't really go over there. But I know that even at the school that we're at, there there is a lot of traffic and there's parents driving and we the teachers and the staff, everyone has it under control. And I'm fully confident every day that I send my son to school that he's safe, he's happy, and he's learning. And that's the most important thing. These are our greatest gifts, our children. And so we should do whatever we can in our power to make sure that we can improve this. I fully support New Pacific School coming to Rancho Cordova. Thank you. All right, then I think we're done then. All right, um, so uh, that finishes uh, the questions. Again, this is a public hearing. We can address any uh, additional questions from the board and uh, any um, uh, thoughts that the board members want to share uh, in the, um, uh, the next agenda item. So with that being said, let's close the public hearing. And that takes us to, uh, I got my sheets out of order, um, agenda item. Uh, agenda item 12, uh, which is uh, the first agenda item under 12 is uh, A, approve or deny uh, P New Pacific School Ranch Cordova Charter Petition. Uh, Superintendent. Yes, and I think I'll start with summarizing some of the key points from the staff's findings, which is what our responsibility is as the authorizing agency for any petition that comes, um, that's submitted to us. But some of these highlights are as follows. We are a district, a quality district of choice that offers choice and options to parents in large schools, medium-sized schools, and in small school settings. And we completely agree, one size does not fit all. And that's the reason this board has created many options for students in Folsom Cordova. We have traditional schools. We have our own charter school. Our board asked us to establish uh, uh, Innovations Academy, which offers individualized programming in a virtual academy um, environment for our students. All of our schools offer social emotional learning with district approved curriculum through second step, through the base program, which is K through 12. Our schools have capacity in those different options. We offer a robust intervention system from grades TK through high school through uh, multi-tiered systems of support and response to intervention uh, to assist our students and give them the uh, scaffolded support they need. We have a robust special education program that focuses on inclusion and the specific needs of our students as those are outlined in their IEPs. We are a district that offers expanded learning and have increased those options of before and after school care for our students. Um, to make sure that they have uh, that opportunity as well. So I realize that in the petitioner's um, presentation tonight, there's a difference in interpretation of uh, what they saw in our findings. However, 
of all the elements that we as the staff and as the authorizing agency, mm. it is our due diligence to look at every single element outlined in the petition and to do that objectively. And as noted in staff's report, 13 of the elements were met. However, there are four significantly deficient findings that were not met that substantiate our recommendation for a denial of this petition. Now the petitioner can resubmit a petition that fixes those significant deficiencies, or they can appeal to the County Board of Education within 30 days. But our responsibility as the authorizing agency is to make sure that there are no significant deficiencies when this petition is finally acted upon by the board. There is a resolution before you tonight with all the specifics that was outlined by our staff in Ms. Wessinger's report that we ask the board to seriously consider in denying the petition based on these findings of fact. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, cool. We'll start off with questions from the board uh, uh, um, or, or comments from the board. Question. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Short. Uh, I think I heard uh, to Dr. Kiefer there, you know, they were talking about who signed the petition in Rancho Cordova. And you mentioned only a few teachers of your staff. You said there were some people then from the community sign. How many, how many uh, from that area signed the petition? Um, and are anybody here in support from that area on the petition from the Rancho Cordova area? So I believe it's, I will say, one half of the number of students that we plan to propose for the first year. And so I'm going to say over 40 parents signed it which required them to give their cell phone number, their email. Um, so they gave a lot of personal information to be on that petition. And why they're not here tonight, it's very difficult to get people to get places. It's hot out. So um, it's just, it's. So you said 40? Uh, about 40 families. Within signed. that area, like White Rock, Cordova Villa, parents. French Cordova. No, I'm talking about that area that it's going to be served. I don't think it was. It was because we're not we're not held to an area either. We can draw students from over over district borders, but it was uh, Ranch Cordova students. Oh, just not from that area. Okay, so how would they get there? So as you heard tonight, families uh, are going from Folsom, Ranch Cordova, all the way to Roseville. So either uh, they will drive or they will walk you or they take transportation. transportation. They would have to drive there, right? Well, I think transportation was brought up tonight as well. I mean, yeah. even the bus service isn't perfect, right? Okay. All right. Um, that's all the questions I have right now. Thank you. Um, board members? You're, you're good. All right. Oh, Mr. Clark? Oh, great. Huh? Okay. okay. All right. So, Ed, thank you uh, uh, for clarification on the signatures. Uh, on the petition because I was going to ask that question, but I think there was something that was brought up uh, regarding dual signatures that you had a signature from a principal, a signature from a couple of teachers that were on this petition. Is that what I heard? Was that true or? So our goal is to get signatures of people who are meaningfully interested in being a part of the charter school and we received those signatures. Okay. Part of the one in Rancho Cordova or the one in Roseville? So is. we're not indentured servants. They're not indentured servants. They're choosing where they want to work. So whether they choose to work with us or not, they meaningfully are interested in, in that school. Hmm. Okay. So for instance, so, the last time we were in front of you, we had a lead petitioner uh, who then went on to work for another organization. We had another person who was going to be our principal, he then took a position in San Diego to be the founding assistant principal of a new, the first new high school in Logan Heights. I can't, I can't hold them to signing a document and then forcing them to come back to work at the organization. That's not in my purview. Okay. But when the signature was given to you back when this, back when we did this back in May, mm -hmm. so that's how far along we are. 
uh, whether they choose to work there or not, that I can't make them. Much like I can't make people who sign the document who are interested in the charter school as parents, can right. make them join the school, but they do like the idea of the school and they do so so much that they're willing to give their phone number and their email. Right, okay. And there was a comment made about our board meetings, you know, the scarcity of uh, people here. Normally, if it's a very important issue, and I, I think you saw it with our teachers. I think you've seen it with our CSCA. I, I think you've seen it with parents that were, I, I'll go back years with the boundary issue. This room was packed, um, full of parents in support or against. I, I don't see that. Um, I heard from one parent, uh, two online, and normally, the way that um, we work in this district is that we have public comments. Do you know how many public comments we had online today before the meeting? Zero. No public comments for or against this charter school. And so that kind of raises a red flag with me. So we only had one family, actually two families in, in Roseville who were actually at the board meeting to present that they're interested in the charter school, mm -hmm. and we have over 72 students already. So I don't, I don't think there's a, uh, there's a cause and effect of people attending a meeting and whether or not they're going to be a part of a charter school. Okay, all right, uh, that's, that's a point. Uh, is it a point well taken for me? No, but you have a point. Um, no, I just, um, you know, looking at this and the traffic study, you said you didn't need one or you're working it out with the city. Um, I don't know, Dr. Kiefer, I, I just, I don't feel comfortable. And I'm worried about the health and safety and well-being of our kids. And I'm worried about them crossing Matherfield. Um, there are no kids on the other side of Rockingham that will go to Cordova Villa. They're not even in that district, that Sac City. And, and like I said, trust me, I know that area. I know it like the back of my hand. It's an industrial area. There's state offices over there. Uh, Actually, there's United Way and other nonprofits across the way in the 95827 area. Not 95630, but 95627. That is Sac City. Uh, even though it's marked as Rancho Cordova, it's Sac City School District. So that was a concern of mine. Uh, the Also, the other concern I had... You know, Mr. It, Clark, I... I have to beg to disagree. Okay. Considering how the citizens of Rancho Cordova talked about the community in which children live in it, and all we look at is all the crime that's there, and we don't think that those children have to go home in that neighborhood, and the fact that we want to put a school so they can get to a school right in their neighborhood, and other places, I would say that's noble work, but trying to give students a school that's in their community. But we have schools. A and school if that the move parents on, choose and, and if versus the about, parent that students have to go to. That's the and, difference. And our parents do have a choice. I'm going I'm to name a couple. Innovations Academy, Folsom Cordova Community Charter. A charter that when I, looked at, when I looked at school. that, it had the same comparisons that you had. Same things. And... If you don't know me, I visit each and every school. So those two schools are TK-12. Please TK do not interrupt me. I visit each and every school, and I see what they're doing as far as individual learning, project-based learning. I see it. So when you have said that you would be the only school in this area that would provide those services, I have to disagree with you. I, I really do, because I'm seeing the same thing or maybe I'm not seeing it when I go visit schools and I've been doing it for six years. I see the same thing. So anyway, you were making a comment? Well, I don't want to interrupt you. I mean, I, I know that the school we put in place will serve the district and the students and the community in a way that uh, will make the families feel as though there's a real... Okay, all right. Um, the other question, the other concern I had is the fiscal impact. Um, 
you said that we're going to experience a growth in the next 10 years. That's 10 years from now. I think our next school is going to be built. I think we're breaking ground, correct me if I'm wrong, superintendent, in 2027. In Rancho Cordova. In Rancho Cordova. OK. Um, yeah, that would probably what, extend us five years out. But do you really think we're going to amass 6,000 students in that period of time? At you know, in 2027, well, actually, school will probably open in 2028. Or do you see it over the years? I was I was working off of your own data about your district and and the growth patterns that you're already seeing. Okay. And so it's even though you, I I do think that the building's going to slow down. I mean, I don't see the growth spurt that's going to happen or that you think is going to happen. Um, the point is, there's families who are interested in this school now. They're, they're interested okay. now to I, enroll I, in the school. You know, honestly, Dr. Kiefer, I'd love to hear from them. I really would. I, I, I would love to hear from them, either through public comment. Well, we did. I heard from three, four. Pardon me? Um, the staff has validated the signatures, which means they signed their name, they put their email and okay. they put their phone number. Okay. But do you understand my, let's digress a little bit. Do you understand my safety concerns? I mean, yeah, they're walking to a neighborhood school, but you're asking them to walk across the street, a, a busy intersection, uh, to an area that's not in a neighborhood, um, that's next or catacorded to a hotel that, yeah, is, is very high crime. I mean, is that the expectation? Or do you expect parents to take them? I expect that, as Mr. Garber said and the parents have said, the students are guests of honor, and we'll treat them to make sure that they get treated as guests of honor. And therefore, whatever it takes to make sure they feel safe to come to school, that's the point of Feel of safe in education. getting to school. Feel safe once they get to school or getting to school? Getting to school, to and from school. How are you going to do that? So it's not required in the charter petition tonight to provide an actual layout of the whole plan. The, the goal tonight is to say, is this plan feasible? Did it meet all the elements? And is this, is this organization capable of making this happen? Okay. I, I do have a few more, but uh, I'll yield my time to the rest of the board members if they have any questions. Mr. Hoover? All right. Are we doing, uh, whoops, doing comments? Quite, what is this right now? Uh, questions. <laughs> uh, it, it's, um, there is an opportunity for a public comment as well. Um, on this item. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I will, um, I don't, I, I'll hold off on any questions at this time so that we can save the time. Okay. Um, I would ask uh, from the, the public, um, if you would like to speak, uh, not to repeat any comments that you previously have provided. Is there Did any? Mr. Ely have questions? Oh, no, he, he didn't. So, uh, Dominic Gualco. Gualco. Thank you. I promise I won't repeat myself. I just want to comment. I ran out of time last time. Um, there's discussion again of the conditional MOU. It is not your job as a board to fix their charter petition, and it's not your staff's job to fix their charter petition. Right? This they're already on round two. And there's still a lot of errors. It's their job to fix it. Your staff's job is to support students, to direct resources to support your students, not to fix a deficient charter petition. And again, we're talking about a petition where denial was recommended by the people you have hired to trust, to direct curriculum, personnel decisions, uh, attendance policies, all of these items. You trust them to lead the district in those ways. Please listen to the report. And again, please do not direct your staff when they have a lot of really important work to do. 
to fix another deficient petition. Thank you. Yes, please. Patrice. Patrice, welcome. Hello. I just wanted to be known that I'm a parent of a senior at Folsom High School. This is my second child. My daughter graduated from Vista del Lago. If we bring in this charter school that nobody wants, that's going to pull money away from the public school that's already in place, well established, and working quite well, why would we want to do this? There's no benefit for the community. The community does not want them. Just say no. Thank you. Next thing I read, I she said her name was Celeste and not Julian. Uh, Celeste. Hi, so I attended not the last board meeting, but the one before, and I brought both of my youngest children to that board meeting. And um, typically, so we were in a school, we were doing a charter in El Dorado Hills previously, and we did everything on Zoom. We did not do in-person. Um, once COVID hit, we, we never did in-person at all. So um, the reason why I'm not physically there tonight is my husband works in the middle of the night and so I don't have a babysitter to watch my children. And so I think that I don't know everyone that signed the petition. Um, I was at the bubbles and the bubbles and the balloon event. And I've been to as many events as I can attend to support the school. I think that you, if you're saying that the families that want the school there, um, you're concerned about transportation, then I would also be concerned about how could their parents attend if they're both working or if it's a single household and they have no childcare. So I think that there are families in this community, in the city of Rancho Cordova, that do want this to be approved, but it's not always physically possible to be there, especially if you've worked all day or you don't have childcare. Because again, the children are the most important thing. So that's all I want to say because that got brought up why people aren't physically there. That's why I'm not physically there today. Thank you. Next we have Wallace. Wallace, welcome. <clears throat> Are you there, Wallace? I was muted. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So I'm a rancher kind of a parent of a student that attended, that attends Mitchell Middle School and one that attends Cordova High School. They attended Riverview STEM Academy, which is also a choice school in Folsom Cordova Unified School District and is a gem in Rancho Cordova. So Mr. Clark, you forgot Riverview STEM in there when you were talking about choice schools. Um, it is still a small school and it does do project lead the way and teaches those students, which my two have benefited from that. So um, there would be replication with the charter school that you're being approved. Um, I did watch the previous meetings. Garrett Gatewood, um, Rancho Cordova City Council member, told you guys, don't approve this. This is not for Rancho. And yet, Digital Tech High was approved. Um, don't approve this one. This is not Rancho friendly. Um, as a parent, listening to Dr. the head of the charter school, very angry. Listen to how he responds to questions, his voice, his demeanor, very angry when questioned. Um, as a parent, I wouldn't want that to be a leader of a school that my children attended. Thank you for listening. Thank you. And uh, finally, we have uh, Eric Garber. Hi again. I'm the principal. I'll address a couple of things and get a chance to finish what's up here last time. I also didn't get to compliment Rocio Aria. Your comments were amazing. 
Um, they came from a position that I would expect from a much older board member, not student um, representative. So very impressive. Um, and also, Mr. Clark, your knowledge of the district, um, I can tell you, you're a resident and you're very passionate about it. So it's just fun for me to be a part of like joining this community to talk about things I'm passionate about. And a couple of things I wanted to add to an earlier comment. One is uh, special education and serving all students. Um, one was the facility itself. Um, we did have a wheelchair bound student who did enroll and that was, um, we were already making everything ADA accessible, but that really pushed us to make sure it was done in time. In three weeks, we made everything accessible for her. Um, her parents said this was the first school for her daughter that really took that to heart and gave her not only just the physical attention, but also the social, emotional, and the academic attention that she hadn't received before. And so I just want to say that this organization lives up to the demands of the students that believe in us. Um, we also have multi-tiered system of support and a really strong special education program um, that has already identified several students that have gone through the system that haven't been identified yet. Um, but we are starting you know, with the 504 plans um, talking to them and their families and trying to build a system around them. Uh, first is our tier one and then our tier two and our tier three. And so we have a, a surrounding network that's doing all of that. Um, and then finally, um, I also was a, a teacher at a charter school, a project-based charter school in the Bright Broderick area of West Sacramento. Um, and I saw firsthand how um, respecting students um, that weren't successful in school, especially high school students um, that live in that area, um, empowering them to take charge and address questions they had about their lives and to invest in, in them as scientists and mathematicians and engineers to solve problems that they cared about changed their lives tremendously. They're now working in community organizations and making their own communities stronger because of that project-based school that was back in the early mid-2000s. Thank you. Thank you. All right, back to the board. Uh, Final comments um, before we entertain the motion. Uh, Mr. President. Yes. All right, well, I know we had a pretty uh, robust discussion and uh, questions and everything, but um, Mr. Kiefer, you and I have a few things in common, obviously. Uh, we both are Rotarians and we live by the four-way test, familiar with that. So what I w wanted to do is just kind of go with the four-way test and kind of equate this to my decision on this whole charter thing. Um, I'm gonna kind of modify the first one because the first one is, is it the truth? Um, let's just say that we are disagreeing on a few things. You have data, you have st um, statistics, you just opened a, a brick and mortar in, in uh, Roseville. Um, you're saying that our staff who has knowledge and has done the research is wrong. Um, I happen to agree with staff on their findings. Is it fair to all concerned no, I don't think it is. I don't think it's fair to our special needs because I asked about that and the answers were kind of danced around. And honestly, when it comes down to it, I don't think it's fair to our students, our socially economically disadvantaged students, our students of color, our students who are ESL. I don't think it's fair to them. Uh, the third one is, will it build uh, goodwill and better friendships? Um, if we approve this, this is going to tear our district apart. We are going to have some unhappy folks. There will not be any goodwill in this district. And it's something that I would probably have to deal with for the next at least two years, possibly six. Uh, the last one, will it be beneficial to all concerned? Here's a question I can ask, who will it benefit? It won't benefit us. It'll, it'll benefit Pacific Charter. But where will we get our benefit in this district? How will this, and I've asked the board this question before, how will this better our schools? Because they are fully aware 
that we've met twice this year on how do we better Rancho Cordova schools, and I have yet to get an answer on that. So I am going to support staff's recommendation to deny this charter. Mr. Short? Yeah. Um, I mean, we've heard a lot of stuff. You know, this is our second round on this, or third round. And um, it's, it's pretty obvious that we don't value, it seems like if the board votes no, uh, for this charter, we don't value our expert staff, our superintendent said it all. Put it in really detail, and I appreciate you being honest and straightforward to tell the board what really is going on here and what great district we have. And the things that we've done in the past to create great programs for our kids in Rancho Cordova. Again, we had a workshop with this board, and we spent two days promising that we were going to improve programs in Rancho Cordova. No mention of bringing charters to Rancho Cordova, where Chris and I were sitting there. I feel kind of really betrayed by this board because we never mentioned it, and just out of the blue, we have charters going to solve the problem for our kids in Rancho Cordova, which you guys have no clue of those neighborhoods. Me, like Chris and I have lived in that area for years. I've been in the region for 40 plus years. 40. How long have you guys been even down there? You don't even know where the street is. Lupe, known her for years. And Josie for over 20 we speak with them. They, they, they live on, that's their hood. That's where they live. They know the kids. And we're over here talking, and they think an outside charter is going to come here and save them. No, they're not. We have great programs, great support, English language supports. If you spent any time listening to our ESL programs and go into those parent meetings and listen to them in their multi-languages, you would be shocked. They don't have even close to that to support those type of kids. Those people come from all over the world. They come in out from it. They have a high nutrition rate. They move out there. We talk about scores. If you understand the underlying things about scores, you would understand the challenges we have in those areas for the years and years of years of challenges in those areas. They won't even understand it. This board doesn't even understand the data and, and, and the... You have to be there, just like Chris Clark said. You have to go and look at it in the classroom day by day by day over the years and see what's happened over the years. So, again, we have a bad location that is really dangerous. That used to be this, when Cityhood came, that was the substation where they put Rockingham, Rockingham uh, Police Station because it was such a bad area. I lived in Lincoln Village in that area. I came from that area, lived for years. It was a high crime area. It's a lot better with cityhood, but that still has some really problems in that area. And the crime, that crime is, is, is a bigger issue that the city doesn't even want to take on. They don't even have the policing force that they need. They have a contract with the sheriff. They, they don't even have the, the, the density of of, of uh, coverage to, to deal with that. So that's another issue the city doesn't want to take on. But we're not responsible for it. We have to deal with the culture and the families there and deal with them in their own realm and their culture. They're not going to be able to do that. It's just, it's, it's just I can't see how that even, even give, come close to that, a charter coming in there. I don't see the support of the people here. I don't, I, you know, Loopy, everybody here, I went out and talked to the community. There's not any major support, one or two people. Maybe there's one that spoke, probably doesn't really understand what we do. A lot of people don't even have an idea what we're doing. It's just a marketing issue, like we were talking about in those, in the, in those shops. We haven't even given an opportunity to, to really promote what this staff has done. And what we went from good to great just district. We spent a lot of time doing that over the years. And this staff and this administration, has done a wonderful job. And by doing this, we're just telling them it's a punch in the gut. It's a punch in the gut, you guys. It's bad. It's embarrassing. 
And we luckily we got good contract negotiations. We got to that point, but still to build valued and our kids and everybody else, it's a bigger picture. We have to listen to the people that are closest to the work. They're the ones that have the best ideas, not us, not you. They do the teachers, the support staff, the parents, the community. They're the ones that know, but if we're going to ignore them, what are we doing here? It's embarrassing. It's going to create, like Chris Clark says, it's going to create a rift in this community that I'm going to have to deal with for years. Years. I'm ashamed. So I'm going to be in support of staff and our experts that know best in our community that say they don't, even a lot of the community. We have to do what we're supposed to do as board of trustees. We're supposed to support our community and our kids. And that's it. That's all I'm going to do. Mr. Lee. Really? Yeah, thanks, Board President. Uh, I'll make this fairly brief. Uh, I know we've talked about this for several months, uh, going back to uh, when we originally brought it up. Uh, you know, my thoughts haven't changed on it much since then. I, I won't uh, belabor things and uh, repeat what I said then. Uh, the main thing that I think of is, uh, and Mr. Clark, I think it's a great question. Who will this benefit? I mean, frankly, if the charter succeeds, it benefits the families and the students that are there. If uh, Rancho Cordova doesn't want this charter, the charter will not succeed. Uh, and I, I, for me, it's as simple as that. If it works, these are families that are going to benefit from it. Uh, does that take revenue? Does that make Folsom Cordova lose money? I guess I don't think of it that way. That money goes with the students. And if this is a successful school, I want to see those students bring that money with them to that school. That doesn't mean that Folsom Cordova can't also provide great programs. Uh, so to me, the impetus is on New Pacific to make it work. And if they can't, it, it won't continue to exist. Uh, so I will be in favor of the charter tonight. Mr. Hoover. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I don't think that we can deny a petition based on the demeanor of the petitioner, but I'll need to check on that. I don't know. Uh, but uh, you were a good sport tonight, Dr. Kiefer, so thank you for hanging in there with all of our questions. Um, I told Mr. Huey that I wasn't going to say much tonight, but uh, <laughs> then I wrote all these notes down, so we'll see what happens. Um, you know, I think it's interesting, the question <clears throat> I've asked a number of times of district staff, of FCEA, is there any charter school that you would recommend an approval of? Uh, I mean, you know, and I, I keep waiting for a response to the answer that isn't, you know, the question's never been fully answered. And it generally it is, you know, kind of followed by, well, maybe, maybe, but it's all hypothetical and there's just no, there, there's never an answer to that question. And so I, I think it's, it's a little bit frustrating tonight um, to see, you know, the, the continued arguments being put forward. We've seen the staff report before. Um, we saw very similar arguments put forward against design tech. In fact, one version of that petition actually had, you know, New Pacific School written into it before it was edited. And so, you know, it's just, it's frustrating because this seems like a copy and paste petition. This seems like uh, something that uh, is just, it's just baked in. It's just, this is what the analysis is going to say no matter who comes and petitions this district. Um, so I, I'm, I'm struggling with that. Um, I also am really struggling with the narrative tonight, uh, particularly when it comes to the location of this school. Um, this idea, I guess I would just ask the question, should kids in these communities not be served because it's a bad neighborhood? I, I mean, I think the, the concept of that is actually pretty awful. Uh, we should actually be applauding New Pacific School for wanting to be placed in a neighborhood that has kids with the highest need. We talk about on this dais all the time that we need to do everything we can to serve every kid in this district, no matter where they live, no matter what their socioeconomic status, no matter what their family situation, we need to find a way to reach those kids. And then when a petition comes before us that is asking to place a school in a neighborhood that folks in this room tonight consider unfit or unsafe, uh, we tell them that they shouldn't locate there. I, I find that pretty problematic. And I actually, uh, when it was mentioned the location of the school was going to be, 
I, I, I had quite the opposite reaction. I think that uh, the idea that they're willing to locate their school in that neighborhood directly contradicts this claim that they don't want to serve our, our district's neediest kids. So I, I think that uh, <laughs> I just, I really, I really hope that we can um, think about this in a different paradigm. And that is that we should want more opportunities for the kids in the neighborhoods where nobody wants to go or nobody wants to be. <clears throat> I also think it's interesting, uh, you know, that I'll point out Charter Schools Act passed in the early 90s was a bipartisan act. Uh, since that time, you know, the issue of charter schools has become more partisan, but the reality is, is that Tonight, we have seen a very partisan agenda put forward. We have had a, a partisan AG's opinion waved in our face. Uh, we, and by the way, there's no lawsuit that has been filed. It's just a threat of a lawsuit that they uh, conveniently timed to happen two weeks before this meeting. Um, this claim against Mr. Huey being a conflict of interest is uh, somewhat fascinating to me, actually. Uh, Mr. Huey has zero financial interest in this decision. However, many of the people opposing this position tonight are opposing because they say that they have a direct financial interest because the, the district could lose ADA funding. I find that interesting. So that we're claiming that Mr. Huey has a conflict of interest when he has no financial stake in this decision, and yet most of the people speaking out in opposition are doing so because they don't want to lose funding. It's an interesting thing to me. Um, and, and I just want to point out a few more contradictions that were brought up tonight that, you know, I've addressed before, but I think they're worth mentioning. Um, we cannot claim that there's no interest in this school. All these comments about, oh, the room's not filled, you know. I, we cannot, on the one hand, claim there's no interest in the school, and on the other hand, claim that it's going to financially harm our school district. Those things don't make any sense. Uh, so this is either going to, uh, either there is going to be interest in the school, as Mr. Huey pointed out, or the school is not going to exist. But the opposition tonight has come in here saying that, uh, you know, criticizing families for not coming out and supporting the school, who are probably working families, families that uh, we know uh, need to be served. We cannot just demand that they show up to a school board meeting that is now at its third or fourth hour um, and then claim that's going to financially harm our district. Uh, New Pacific School, uh, it's been claimed, New Pacific School will not be providing anything better than what we are currently offering. Great. If that is the case, then all of those kids are going to choose FCUSD schools. But what, you've, but what you've heard tonight is from a parent who drives her child from Rancho Cordova to Roseville because she needs a different academic opportunity for her student. It's not because she hates FCUSD schools. None of the people on this dais hate FCUSD schools. We love FCUSD schools. But as was mentioned by another uh, community member tonight, every kid learns differently. And parents are going to pick a school that best fits the needs of their child. Uh, I also want to kind of talk about this whole commentary on the FCUSD Charter School and Innovations Academy. Those are great programs. We know that. I, my kids, for a short period of time, went through FCUSD Charter School. That is a homeschooling program. That is not similar to New Pacific School and what they're uh, offering in this petition. Uh, Innovations Academy is a, a fully online school. Again, a great option for families that want to be fully online. Does not compare to New Pacific School. And you know, honestly, I have to point out that I love all of our offerings and we need to keep improving, but both of those options are either declining or serving a very small number of students in our district. And so we need this idea that those schools would somehow replace the need for a new Pacific school, I think, are, are, are problematic. Um, our superintendent was just in Rancho Cordova a few weeks ago talking about our projected growth. You know, there's a, been a lot of comments tonight about, oh, we're not really going to grow. Well, that's not what we're telling the community. Uh, we were just in Rancho Cordova a few weeks ago talking about all the ways we're going to grow. President Reed and I just went on a tour of all of our future school sites of the future six to seven schools that we plan to build in the next 10 to 15 years. No, it's not going to happen overnight. 
but we are projected to grow. And I, I do think it's a little disingenuous for the staff to uh, put their projection of uh, financial impact uh, based on current enrollment without kind of just putting that fact, at least a mention of it, that we are going to be growing as well, because that is something we need to take into account. Um, it's not our job to fix Dr. Kiefer's petition. That is absolutely correct. But it is our job to do what's best for the kids in our community. And uh, if anyone has looked at the data in our Rancho Cordova schools, President Reed actually read a lot of our numbers last time we discussed this topic. And the achievement gap between Folsom and Rancho Cordova students continues to persist. And we have to start thinking beyond the status quo. And we've done that, by the way. We've done that in a lot of ways on our own and in our own district. We pass, uh, Mr. Reed uh, pass, proposed and we passed full day kindergarten uh, for our Rancho Cordova students. Uh, I proposed and we passed full day first and second grade for all of the students in our district. Dr. Huber has proposed new STEM programs in our Rancho schools. That work does not stop based on this decision tonight. And so lastly, I'm just gonna close uh, by just saying that we are talking about a small public school in this district if we approve this petition. Yes, charter schools are public schools. Tuition-free options for families that do not have the means to choose a school outside of the traditional system. And I, I know that I sound like a broken record because I say this every meeting, I say this every time we discuss this, but anybody with means has the ability to choose a school of their choice. They can pick up their family and they can move to a public school district or a neighborhood that has a public, traditional public school that meets their needs or that has high, uh, uh, you know, high quality offerings. Or they can use their means to pay for private school tuition for their child. The, the only students in our community that do not have that are the ones that do not have the means to do either of those things. And so many of our students in Rancho Cordova, and we've talked about it tonight, those that are socioeconomically disadvantaged, do not have the ability to do either of those things. And yes, we as a school district has a responsibility to make our Rancho Cordova traditional public schools as good as possible. And we have to continue to do that. But we also should do what's best for families and approve this school tonight so that the families in those districts that don't have the means to do those things can actually choose an option, a free tuition free option for their family. So I'll be in support tonight, thanks. Board member Srivatov, did you have any closing thoughts? There we go. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to bring in some of the student input that um, we've gathered over the past couple of weeks. Um, there has been overwhelming concern about the potential of implementing New Pacific Charter in Rancho Cordova. Um, namely, students are considered about the loss of funding, resources, and staff to the charter, um, and they believe that they are far more effective utilized within their existing educational programs. Personally, I've been in the district since I was in preschool, and I strongly believe in the educational programs that Folsom Cordova provides because they are community-based. I had project-based learning at Theodore Judah. Um, I had the STEM program and Project Lead the Way at Sutter and a variety of CTE opportunities at Vista. The innovative educational opportunities that Charter offers are already being offered by Folsom Cordova. And as we expand those, expand those programs, they require funding, resources, and well-supported staff. I also want to reflect the points made by the labor unions and staff report tonight. Our staff deserves high quality benefits rather than deflected funding. We have to work with, we have work to do within our schools, um, but it comes from within our community rather than outside. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, board member Perez. Personally, I would much rather advocate for a charter school that is founded to address specific areas of a community need that district schools have difficulty with. For example, a charter school that caters only to students with special needs, various physical, social, and emotional, emotional disabilities, rather than picking their students and taking talented ones away with that will essentially leave a small pool of strong students in local public schools. Our schools are already adequately serving all students with all the programs and I believe that New Pacific Charter Schools does not outperform our current schools. I and several other peers love our community and our Cordova High School. Therefore, I still believe that we should really continue to work to improve the schools we already have and build a solid educational infrastructure. This is achievable, and I stand in agreement with the teachers, staff, and all Cordova citizens in hopes for the denial of this petition. It is unfair to even collect votes from a non ranch Cordova citizens, especially if no genuine effort is being made to support and understand our city. 
Therefore, it is critical to consider all statements from our community members and concerned parents. Thank you. All right, uh, as for uh, my comments, um, you know, I, I'm not gonna go through the thing that I went through uh, in November when this uh, proposal uh, was before the board at that time. Uh, during that time, I voted no against the proposal. Um, and I went into a, a long detail of, of specific items, uh, and I probably spoke for 15, 20 minutes, regarding choice and competition and how I saw that choice and competition was a good thing, that it made everybody stronger. I went into details regarding student performance. I actually read the, the perf student performance of all the Folsom Cordova schools uh, in Rancho Cordova and compared it to the, the Folsom schools. Clearly, there's a, a performance gap, not a small one, a significant one. Um, went into a number of uh, uh, details into the elements of the charter school law and compared to uh, each of the areas that uh, was found to be deficient. Uh, and I specifically identified one that I agreed with and that's the reason why I voted against it. Um, uh, I also, um, uh, when I became board president, I specifically turned our annual workshop in January into a focus on how can we improve the Rancho Cordova community uh, and help the, uh, the Rancho Cordova schools. Um, that was the focus, that was the sole focus of our conversation. We brainstormed a lot. Uh, we talked about a lot of items that can uh, help the Rancho Cordova community. Um, in my mind, uh, charter school is one of those that can help the Rancho Cordova community. Um, I uh, would also um, point out that the, uh, the elements that have been uh, questioned, which I, I don't necessarily agree with, but they uh, have been questioned, uh, could be very easily addressed in the exact same MOU that we provided to Design Tech. Uh, although, actually, I would uh, potentially add two additional ones, uh, one related to uh, health and safety procedures being included in the, uh, uh, the MOU, and that, uh, um, I don't know if it has to be a condition, but uh, Mr. Kiefer did, in the, or excuse me, Dr. Kiefer did indicate uh, that the uh, school uh, would not exceed 400 students, uh, and that they were not seeking or no, uh, no desire to seek Prop 39. So, uh, you know, I would be perfectly comfortable with that being built into the MOU uh, as well. So the bottom line is I uh, am supportive of this MOU this evening. Um, uh, and it should not have been a mystery. This is the exact same MOU that was submitted in November. And I specifically said, if you deal with the issue related to um, uh, what I thought was an unachievable um, goal, which was the, um, the attendance. Uh, it did not meet the criteria of the law. Uh, that was uh, how it was analyzed. It has been removed. With that removal, um, I support this uh, uh, um, proposal uh, with the addition of those conditions. And there are, uh, I guess that would make it the eight conditions that were applied to design tech uh, plus um, uh, the health and safety. Uh, again, I think the enrollment uh, and Prop 39, uh, Dr. Kiefer already agreed, uh, would be enroll, um, incorporated into the MOU. So uh, that's where I stand. So is there a motion? I'll motion uh, that the petition be approved with the uh, amendments suggested by Mr. Reed. I'll second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Um, I guess I should read those, uh, those uh, uh, elements rather than simply re re referencing design tech. Uh, but essentially it's uh, that the uh, superintendent staff negotiate with New Pacific Charter School uh, to develop an MOU uh, that's conditioned uh, with the following elements, a preference for students who reside in the city of Rancho Cordova and describing any other lottery preferences 
Two, identify an acceptable location for the physical campus. Three, language requiring similar or higher CASP testing scores, although I, I did edit this one to Cordova High for grades nine through 12, and the average score for, uh, from Rancho Cordova schools for grades K6 uh, and uh, seven, eight. Or seven, excuse me, K through five and um, six through eight, excuse me. Uh, four, uh, language addressing the out, any outstanding special education requirements. Five, language requiring a local representative on the new Pacific board. Six, language requiring all teachers to be credentialed. Seven, a requirement, or, or, excuse me, a recruitment plan to encourage diversity of applicants. Uh, eight, details related to reporting and FCUSD oversight roles, uh, nine health and safety procedures, uh, and then, uh, like I said, the other two, I think, uh, have already been agreed to be put into the MOU. So, President Reed, I don't think we can require that the charter school not request Prop 39 facilities. Um, a charter school is entitled to do that under the law, and we cannot contract. Uh, All right, that's fine. Then contrary to law, so that piece we would have to leave out. That's fine. Well, I, I'll leave that to the negotiating uh, with between staff and, uh, and New Pacific. So, uh, <coughs> Superintendent, call the roll. Mr. Reed? Aye. Mr. Hoover? Aye. Mr. Clark? No. Mr. Short? No. Mr. Huey? Aye. Ms. Perez? No. Ms. Shravasta? No. Okay. Motion to approve the charter carries three to two. Um, we'll not be accepting the resolution that staff put before you this evening. Um, the amendments to the um, resolution or to the approval will be an MOU that includes the list that Mr. Reed read off, and we'll make sure that we get a copy of that so we can get it in the minutes. All right, thank you. Uh, do we want to take five minutes? Are we good? I'm good. I mean, it's up to you guys. Yeah. Good. All right. Uh, next item B, renew. Uh, renew action to approve memorandum of understanding between Folsom Cordova Unified School District and Design Tech High School, Rancho Cordova. Superintendent. Yes, on June 23rd, 2022, the board took action to approve the charter petition for Design Tech High School. As part of the action, the board directed the superintendent and my staff to negotiate the terms of an MOU between the district and Design Tech High School. The approval of Design Tech High School charter petition was conditional on certain conditions being satisfied through an MOU between the district and Design Tech High School. The MOU for which the board is considering taking action on tonight addresses those conditions that were directed per the board on June 23rd, 2022. The propriety of the approval of the DTS or Design Tech High School charter petition is not an issue in this particular meeting because the board has already taken action on the charter petition. So we would recommend um, with the negotiations that we've completed with Dr. Montgomery that the board approve that uh, conditional MOU. Okay, uh, any questions from the board? No, uh, any questions from the audience? Any online? No, back to the board, is there a motion? No. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, go ahead. Oh, that's, yeah, that's fine. Oh, yeah. yeah, please. Um, you have substantial evidence that this MOU may not be enforceable. Um, you asked for the MOU because you see substantial weaknesses or areas where the, where the petitioner did not satisfy, satisfy you in the petition. Put yourselves in the driver's seat hold them accountable, avoid costly legal battles, have, de have design tech resubmit their petition with the changes you want. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, back to the board. Is there a motion? Well, uh, at that comment. point, we have oh, quest <laughs> oh, questions. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, I just ahead. want to ask the superintendent, how much staff time and cost did this cost us legal fees and just doing one simple MOU? instead of putting the proof of the burden on the applicant like we're supposed to be? Well, I don't have that number in front of me, but I can tell you it's been hours um, yeah. with staff's time and with our attorney's time. And, you know, it went back and forth between our attorney and their attorney. 
um, multiple times because the you know the negotiation pro process doesn't happen with just one fell right. swoop. We have to go back and forth and have discussion. Right. So um, yes, it did take additional time. I don't I don't we, know. We didn't budget for this either, did we? No. <laughs> so this next one's going to cost a lot too. Just for the record, you guys. Any other comments? No, oh, I move that we approve the MOU. I'll second. All right. So we have a motion and a second. Superintendent, take the call. Roll. Mr. Reed? Aye. Mr. Hoover? Aye. Mr. Clark? No. Mr. Short? No. Mr. Huey? Aye. Ms. Perez? No. Ms. Shrivasta? No. Motion carries 3 2. All right. And item 12C, approved 2021 2022 unaudited actual financial report. Uh, actual revenues and expenditure, uh, expenditures reported on the annual state budget forms, general fund, and other funds for the state of California. Superintendent. Yes, we have Sean Martin, and I also want to thank Linda Thurlow for the preparation of the unaudited actuals. Uh, Mr. Martin has um, uh, an overview of uh, the results of the reconciling of our budget from our adopted budget. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Martin. Good evening. Uh, I do want to recognize uh, Linda here this evening and, of course, the entire team for closing out the books. Um, it's late night, so we'll go quickly through these documents. Uh, first couple pages are just boilerplate talking about uh, closing of the books, which you are all familiar with. You've gone through this process before. Um, those that have not gone through this before, if you'd like to talk separately, we can definitely go over the time and spend some time reviewing this information because it's very critical and important information. Uh, what we're talking about today is the closing of the books through June 30th of our audit. That's what's called the unaudited actuals. We will be coming back later to provide to the board um, after the, these items are actually audited, then we will actually have our audit report. So um, looking at this slide, I can tell I need glasses because it is very blurry. Uh, but what we're looking here is comparison of our revenues from what we anticipated closing the books back in June. Um, and it was actually information as of probably May uh, and compared to what we actually did close the books. And what we're trying to do is be obviously as close as possible from the budget to the actuals. And, and I am very happy with the team. We did an excellent job of bringing these numbers in. Um, you see on the revenue side, uh, there is an adjustment on the unrestricted side of about a half a million dollars. But that's primarily due to recognition of our financial investment with PARS uh, for our pension uh, trust fund. Um, and so because the stock market dropped, so this is an unrealized loss there, but we have to recognize it in the books. Uh, on the restricted account side, what you're seeing there is the decrease in revenues is really because of how we have to recognize federal dollars. If we do not spend them, we have to defer them. So it, it decreases what the revenues look like, but correspondingly, you'll see a decrease in the expenditures on the restricted side. Um, so when all said and done, we were about $3 million less uh, in revenues than what we were projecting. Um, when, which all in all, especially because of the deferrals, uh, is pretty spot on. Uh, looking at on the expenditure side, you can see adjustments there on the unrestricted. In most categories, you normally do see money fall out. That is traditionally the way we do it because we're budgeting assumption of full usage of all of our subs, extra time, um, all of the, the benefit costs, and not all those things happen. And so, so you see some savings there. Um, additionally, you see co contracted services, the final numbers for that dropping down. Mostly that was related to some activities with regards to fundraising, um, some accounts for transportation costs, things of that nature, where we had budgeted uh, because we expected additional costs that didn't fully come in. So uh, on the restricted side, you see a lot of money falling out there. That is because with a lot of our categorical programs, specifically our title accounts, some of those, we budget all the award uh, throughout the year and then at the very end we, we pull that back because otherwise we can't recognize the revenue and we're trying to balance those resources and so it's more of an accounting methodology than anything and within the restricted side. Um, overall you can see about seven million falling out in expenditures but only a little over a million on the unrestricted side. When you bring it all together, you have the combined budget summary here. We're really looking at the yellow column. That's the one that we have the most uh, control over uh, when it comes to using priorities and decision making for the board. Uh, you can see that we were projecting a surplus of about $250,000. We ended the year with about $800,000, so a net difference of about six hundred. dollars So not too bad all in all on a almost $300 million budget. Uh, we, we pretty much hit the mark. Again, I want to recognize the team and the effort that they took to really dive into those accounts where we're, we're really working on trying to be as accurate as possible through that process. So, 
Um, on the next slide here, you see our ending fund balance. We're, we're ending the year with about $66 million in reserves. Uh, about uh, 20 million of it is restricted accounts. And then the remaining about 45 million you can see is split between committed accounts, which the board has taken action on. Those are accounts where the board has taken formal action to commit those funds for specific purposes. You can see what we've actually done is we have local resources associated with most of these activities because we, we have specific budget activities that we want to do with those dollars. Uh, the largest one is supplemental funding. That is a significant balance in there, to be honest, about 7.7 .7 million, and our, our award is probably somewhere around 13 to 14 million. So it's a significant reserve. And so what we're going to be doing at the next board meeting is discussing um, how we're using those dollars, what our priorities are, and we're going to be coming with some um, recommendations of changing on how we do some of our allocations to our sites and prioritizing of programs. So that'll be at the next board meeting. Um, and then the last uh, group pot is the assigned. That's dollars that could be used for, for any designation that the board wanted, but we've put specifically money aside for professional development and also school site safety needs coming out of the safety committee that we had talked about. And then the remaining future district uncertainties, I can tell you where that's going. That was what you just approved last uh, uh, earlier the night on the salary increases and one-time payments. Well, that's going to eat up all of those dollars plus some. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, additionally, there are all the other fund forms in there for you guys to review if you have any questions on it. It's only 140 pages. I'm sure you guys will love that. Uh, then there's also supplemental information about all of the specific programs and activities that we have to uh, do analyze. Anything where there's a requirement, we've met that requirement just so that everybody is aware. Um, timeline for the remainder of the activities. The next big discussion will be next board meeting. I just talked about supplemental funding. Actually, yeah, the meeting on the 22nd will be bringing information about supplemental funding. That will be a lengthy conversation. So um, hopefully we don't have any charter applications between now and then. Uh, and then we, we have some other items that we will be hitting throughout the year here. Uh, any questions that I can provide to the board? Um, again, it, if you do have specific questions, I would love to meet. We can go over the items specifically with closing the books. It's a nice time to look at what happened over the previous year. So, Questions from the board? No? All right. Uh, any questions from the audience or comments? Any online? No? Nope. Hearing none, back to the board. Uh, is there a motion? I'll move it. A motion by Mr. Clark. Second. A second by Mr. Short. Uh, Superintendent, take the roll. Mr. Reed? Aye. Mr. Hoover? Aye. Mr. Clark? Aye. Mr. Short? Aye. Mr. Huey? Aye. Ms. Perez? Aye. Ms. Shrivastav? Aye. Motion carries 5-0. Make a motion. <laughs> I guess it's my cue, huh? Uh, Mr. President, I would like to make a motion to extend the meeting until 11 p.m. Okay. There's a motion to extend the meeting under uh, the board bylaws to 11 p.m. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Huey. Superintendent, take the roll. Mr. Reed? Aye. Mr. Hoover? Aye. Mr. Clark? Aye. Mr. Short? Aye. Mr. Huey? Aye. Ms. Perez? Aye. Ms. Shrivastav? Aye. Motion carries by vote. All right. Uh, next agenda item is D, approve board policy 5141.21, administra administering medication and monitoring health conditions. Superintendent? Yes, the board asked us to fast track this board policy so that we could revise it um, to include um, the anti-opioid um, treatment at all of our school sites uh, in the event that we might need that. So Carrie Kay is here today. She has been working on this for um, some time, but would be the person that would help uh, implement uh, this once the board approves it so that we have folks that are trained um, and that we keep the... Um, the uh, actual uh, Narcan uh, up to date at each of our school sites too. So with that, we'll entertain any questions. Uh, Mr. President. Yes. Um, just a question for um, uh, Carrie. Uh, when will that training start if it's approved? Uh, can you hear me? Okay, it is on. Uh, that's a great question and we're working on those details because my feeling is before we, the Narcan training itself is very fast. Okay. That's easy. But we need to supply our staff with a full scope of the substances that can potentially be on our campuses. It is not just opioids. There are stimulants right. and there are other classes of drugs. And it's been a number of years since we have held something called the DITEP training, drug information training for educational professionals put on by CHP, locally Folsom PD has the capacity and willingness to do that for our staff. So we're working on getting those dates together. It's a two-day training. Okay. So I recognize 
Uh, that's a hard ask right now of a lot of our staff. But uh, meeting with the secondary principals this morning planted that seed that maybe we can focus on some key staff now and roll that out to more interested folks during a PD opportunity, potentially June or July timeframe. So we would do that as well with our elementary teams. So I know that was a long answer for a short question. No, that was perfect. Okay. Thank you. Um, actually, I, I appreciate staff and um, the board actually supporting this. Um, and I'm glad it was a quick turnaround. If there are no other uh, questions from the board, I'd like well, it's actually just the first read, so I don't have to move on anything. Uh, an action item. No, it's an action item. Is it? Yeah. yeah. Oh, it is. Yeah. That's a good thing well, I made that motion to extend the meeting. Let me just make sure there's no audience. Okay. Uh, are there any public comment? Online? Nope. All right. Back to the board. Um, if there are no other questions, I'd like to move this. All right. A motion by Mr. Clark. Is there a second? I'll second. Second by Mr. Huey. Superintendent, take the roll. Mr. Reed? Aye. Mr. Hoover? Aye. Mr. Clark? Aye. Mr. Short? Aye. Mr. Huey? Aye. Uh, Ms. Trivastov? Aye. And Ms. Perez stepped away, so motion carries 5-0. Okay. Uh, item E, approve certificated assignment under a variable term waiver for oh. the 2022-2023 school year. Superintendent? Yes, this uh, uh, conditional... Um, waiver or variable waiver would allow Cordova High School teacher Richard Hardin, who has a preliminary de designated subjects credential in ROTC, to be able to teach English learners under this waiver, which he has consented to do. All right. Any questions from the board? <laughs> Never mind. No. That was going to be a smart Okay. Never mind. Uh, any comments from the public online? No. Nope. Back to the board. Uh, is there a motion? I'll move it. Motion by Mr. Clark. Second. Second by Mr. Huey. Uh, Superintendent, call the roll. Mr. Reed? Aye. Mr. Hoover? Aye. Mr. Clark? Aye. Mr. Short? Aye. Mr. Huey? Aye. Uh, Ms. Trivasov? Aye. Motion carries 5-0. Okay. Uh, moving on to agenda item 13, discussion. Uh, first read, board policy 5131.62, smoking, uh, vaping, tobacco. Superintendent. Yes, uh, this item is uh, the board policy is coming before the board uh, for a first read. It's already gone through our uh, board policy subcommittee. I'm going to ask Dr. Huber to point out what the um, changes are and take it away. Uh, there actually obviously was no changes to the board policy. What we did was just make clear in the administrative regulations that we um, engage students in uh, preventive me measures in tobacco cessation. Uh, we don't suspend students um, who are found with, you know, vaping products, or we found that, you know, that they are using tobacco products. So that is is really the difference here. Is is really the way the district treats tobacco, uh, as opposed to the way we might have treated it ten years ago. So um, we're preventative now, and we don't um, go down the discipline punishment road unless a student and their parent opt to not engage um, with the cessation program or those kind of things. If they said, nope, you know, we're not interested in doing any of that and we'd rather, you know, our student be suspended. But as of yet, I don't know anyone who's done that. So, but there is no change at all to the board policy. Okay. Any questions from the board? Uh, any comments from the public? All right, this is just uh, for first read, so there is no vote on that tonight. So uh, moving to uh, agenda item 14, superintendent's report. Yes, uh, again, I wanna thank the board for their support and collaboration um, working with us as district staff and thank Mr. Ogden and Mr. Martin and our negotiating teams in completing the agreements with FCEA, C CSEA and FCLA. Um, so we're very, um, grateful for that collaboration and uh, that we came to an agreement that we believe is going to, again, serve our district well and help us retain quality employees and to recruit um, employees into those vacant positions. Um, I also attended the student advisory board meeting yesterday and I wanna commend um, both Rosie and Rhea for uh, an excellent job in facilitating yesterday's meeting. There were 30 students there representing all of our middle and high schools. That's the most robust group of SAB that I've seen. And the uh, agenda that they had was also a very ambitious agenda and they got through it all and they um, elected their officers yesterday. 
Uh, they have uh, some great ideas uh, coming forward, but they also are very interested in serving on our subcommittees and we'll have participation from both of our student board members as well as some of our student advisory board members who are interested in being on some of those committees. So we'll, we'll see more and hear more from our students um, through that avenue as well. So thank you to both of you. All right, uh, let's see, uh, board member comments. Um, uh, let's see, uh, we, let's we start. Advanced planning first, or can we you wanna do that and then go back up to board member uh, reports to close the night out? Sure, uh, unless there's an objection. Is there any objection to going out of order? Uh, we'll go to agenda item 16, advanced planning. Next board meeting is on September 22nd, 2022. You have the 12 month calendar in your, um, in the packet. Uh, suggested future agenda items. Uh, uh, Mr. Clark. President, uh, by uh, consensus of the board, I'd like to uh, place um, an overview on measure H and how the money is being spent in the area of athletics. And I'd also like to, with the board's consent, uh, look at measure P in their oversight committee and get a report on repairs and classrooms that have been happening at Cordova. And those can be future agenda items. So just, I think the board just needs to be updated on what has been done uh, at Cordova, uh, where we are with the status on um, the PAC, um, getting that fixed up. So um, those are the two things that I'd like to see on a future agenda. Okay, do we have board consensus? Yeah, I'd be happy to see that as well. Yep. Good with that. Okay, good. I am as well. So if we can add that. Is there any other items uh, that folks want to daylight uh, for a future uh, board meeting? No? Oh, okay. Uh, then we are finished with agenda item uh, 16 back to uh, board member uh, reports. So um, let's see. Let's start with the student board members. Um, uh, Board member uh, Perez. Okay, so going on with our uh, RSAB meeting on Wednesday, we I'm just mainly looking forward for our next one and then as well as continuing communicating with my principal at Cordova High about our school agenda. Okay. Uh, board member Srivasta. Yeah, um, I just want to say that I'm really grateful that the agreements um, with our labor unions passed tonight. I'm grateful that the teachers that I know and love um, will now be supported by the benefits that reflect their hard work and dedication. Um, and I just want to say I'm disappointed at the passing of New Pacific Charter, and I hope that regardless, we will continue to support our students in Rancho Cordova um, in the utmost way. Thanks. All right, thank you. Uh, board member Huey. Thank you. Uh, yeah, as well, wanted to uh, just say I'm excited to see FCA CSEA, FCLA, all uh, pass our MOUs today. I did want to make a, kind of a special shout out for that. Um, I was really excited to see our, our not only an 8% uh, across the board increase, but our special education teachers get an additional 3% ongoing increase. Uh, I think that is a really big deal. And hopefully that expresses just a, a small measure of how much we value our special education teachers. Uh, one last comment, I uh, just wanted to uh, commend our district staff. I, I work in a neighboring district and recently met a, uh, a woman who had attended a training within the last few weeks with us. Um, she had nothing but amazing things to say about the hospitality warmth uh, from everybody that she met, including our superintendent who uh, greeted her kindly and warmly. And so just wanted to say thank you. I, that comes across um, not just to us, but to, uh, to our neighbors as well. Uh, Mr. Clark. Well, I mean, sorry. You're I'm looking at me. Yeah, I'm looking at you, <laughs> Mr. Short. That's Mr. Short. <laughs> Mr. Short. Sorry. Uh, I, I am also glad that we uh, were able to reach agreement on all the contracts. So that's a really great step. However, I am saddened tonight that we put another punch into our staff about approving a charter. I don't think uh, we don't realize what makes a great organization 
is really leadership that supports staff and organizations and empowers our people and listen to the people that are closest to work to understand what we're doing and listening to our community and listening to everybody. But where I understand, I, I am saddened that really that a 3-2 vote is going to be, con it seems like it's going to be continuous and we have the Rancho Cordova representative boards here in the Folsom and it seems like a pattern. And I'm, I, I hopefully that we can work forward and start collaborating a little bit better about our, our districts as a whole, because we do have areas now. That's it. Thank you. All right. Um, Mr. Clark. I'm going to keep it kind of short. Um, congratulations to all of the bargaining units. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ogden, for all your hard work and the negotiating team. Um, and Dr. Kleegan for putting everything together to make sure that we do recognize and appreciate our teachers, our uh, classified staff, and all the others that will be uh, affected by this um, increase in salary. Um, you know, this charter vote, I, I still believe in good governance. I, even though and this is probably not the first time, probably won't be the last time that uh, two of us were outvoted. Um, you know, we just got to see what happens. I, I still have the funny feeling that this is not going to benefit everyone. Um, I still have a funny feeling that our special needs kids will not be recognized, will not be enrolled. And this facility, and I have to just say this, it is not in a neighborhood. It is in an industrial area where traffic is bad. And I pray to God, and I don't wish this upon any child that is going to cross Mather Field to get hit by a vehicle. I pray to God that that doesn't, that doesn't happen. If not, there is going to be fallout from this community. And I can guarantee you that those residents of Rancho Cordova are going to be in this boardroom. And they're going to be pointing fingers. And guess who's going to take, take the hit? Us. Sitting up on this dais that a child was hit or a child was abducted, you know, and I'm, I'm just kind of picturing that area right now, liquor store, hotel. Um, I just see that. But I'm going to have to get past that. We're going to have to move forward. And we're going to have to work on how we can make our Rancho Cordova schools better. And I can guarantee you I will fight hard until I can't fight anymore to make sure that our schools are recognized and they get better. Um, with that being said, I am going to visit sites tomorrow because, honestly, I need my therapy. I need to see my kids. Um, it looks like I'm going to be at Cordova Villa, White Rock, Williamson, uh, Mills at lunchtime, and Cordova. Um, so I look forward to visiting those schools tomorrow. Uh, and then, the Superintendent, if I can make one request, we have not had a two-by-two two with parks, I think probably about two years, if I remember. I, I think we need to get them back on the agenda. We need to talk about um, safety of our kids, especially in Fettersville Park in Rancho Cordova. Um, so hopefully we can uh, get with our... Uh, Parks Department and do a two by two just to catch up. Other than that, um, I'm good. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hoover. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, as uh, stated, congrats to our, uh, our teachers, our classified staff, uh, leadership staff. I'm very excited for all of you. Um, you know, based on our conversation, uh, earlier on cell phones and, and such. Um, 
I'm just going to bring it up again, although I guess I should have brought it up under uh, future board action, not that our staff needs any more work, but uh, cell phone free week. I'm just saying we should try it. Don't, the student board members should close their ears probably, but uh, no, I, I think I like the idea of the Friday morning thing or something that we could maybe spur as a board and maybe working with SAB on, on, on some sort of compromise that we could figure out just to, and it's not even about cell phones. It's just to get uh, our students in a mindset where, you know, there's not that connection to electronics for a, sh a certain period of time, right? Mm -hmm. I think that'd be that'd be great. Um, uh, I'm very thankful. I just want to point out a couple of things that got, that passed on consent tonight. Uh, very excited about renewing our contract with Soilborn Farms and keeping those CTE programs, our agriculture and culinary and um, nutritional programs going at Cordova High School. Uh, I was super excited to see that. Uh, and a program that's very close to my heart is the uh, Folsom's Hope Mentoring Program was also approved on consent tonight. Uh, so very, very excited to see that. I, I believe that had to be suspended during COVID. I don't remember for sure, but I think there was a period where we had to stop that. So I'm really excited to, to see that uh, coming back to Theodore Judah and Blanche Sprints and Sutter Middle and Folsom High and Folsom Lake High. So, um, and uh, I just want to say thanks to uh, Mr. Reed and the superintendent and Matt Washburn for taking us on a, um, a trip uh, to see all of our future school sites. Uh, we are, you know, obviously have a lot of work in our future. So it was very exciting to get out there and kind of try to envision the future of our district and, and see what's coming on the horizon. And I look forward to uh, continuing to have those discussions as well. Uh, that's it for me. Thanks. All right. Um, so uh, no official, uh, I guess, board related uh, comments for me this evening. Uh, but we, we did start uh, the meeting with a moment of silence and, and would like to end the meeting with a moment of silence as well. Um, obviously, a, a major world event happened today, um, the passing of Queen Elizabeth II, uh, the monarch of uh, Great Britain. Uh, it's, it tells you something that the United States is lowering its flags to half staff for the monarch of the country that we uh, fought in a, a war um, 200 and what, almost uh, 45 years ago uh, to uh, achieve our independence. But it really does speak volumes about the special relationship between our two countries, that um, we uh, value our relationship with uh, Great Britain uh, so much that we would lower our flags to half staff. Um, obviously, she, uh, she served as the monarch for 70 years. Uh, I think it's the record for a British monarch, and I think it came in second uh, for the length of any monarch in the, uh, or any leader uh, in, in the world. So uh, if we could just end with a, a moment of silence, and then we'll uh, gavel out. All right. Uh, if there's no objection, we'll adjourn the meeting by unanimous consent. Hearing none, we're adjourned. Thank you.